figure it out in a okay. second. Okay. Good, good evening. Thank all of you for being here tonight. Today is May the 2nd, 2023. Our thought for today is each of us guard a gate of change that can only be opened from the inside. That's Stephen Covey. I'm gonna go ahead and officially call this meeting to order tonight. Uh, we have with us a special guest tonight, um, Pastor Brad Rutledge is here from the Hope Church. Sir, if you would please come on up and lead us in our invocation tonight and lead us in our pledge as well. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? I wanna say welcome tonight and uh, tell us a little bit about your ministry as well. Yes, sir. Well, thank you, Chairman Baines, and uh, thank you to all your commissioners for having us tonight, having me here tonight. Uh, so glad to be here and honored uh, that you ask us. Yes, I am uh, Brad Rutledge. I'm the pastor of uh, uh, the newly formed Hope Church of Newton, and uh, we're meeting over in the, uh, in the center right next to the uh, Chamber of Commerce. We, uh, we started on September the 4th. Uh, we're about eight months old this week. And uh, we are growing like mad, mm -hmm. and we are excited. Uh, our purpose is to offer space and grace and help people find their true purpose in Jesus Christ. And uh, we're making great headways in that. And uh, me personally, I was born and raised here in Newton County. I, I love this county, this community. Uh, I was actually raised in the Holy Land, Porterdale. And uh, so, uh, but uh, be careful now. Let's not, uh, everybody knows that's where Jesus was originally from. So, but, but anyway, uh, I am honored to be here with you. And uh, if we could, let's pray together. Thank you, sir. Let us bow. Lord God, our gracious and most heavenly Father, tonight, this evening, we approach the throne of grace with humble hearts and we're grateful to be able to call on the living and loving God who is close and caring and competent and capable and, Father, consistent. We stand before you tonight, Father, and we gather together in your name. And with you alone to guide us, make yourself at home in all of our hearts tonight, Father. I pray, God, that you would teach us the way that we must go and how to pursue that way, Father. We are at times weak and sinful and fallible and for that reason we're grateful for your grace and your leading lord the leading of your precious holy spirit so by your spirit tonight god would you promote order as only you can do so gently god guide these leaders our commissioners of this great county of newton county lord i pray first lord for our citizens of our great county father um, God, we are currently in some difficult and hard times. Of inflation alone, uh, God, has made it hard, and the rising cost of almost everything has caused change that is, uh, to say the least, quite uncomfortable. God, bless and provide for our citizens. God, make the ends meet. Your word tells us that, Lord, uh, you'll meet our needs according to your will, and I pray tonight, God, that you would provide for the basic needs for housing, for food, for clothing, their medical needs, and their safety, Father. We thank you in advance for doing so, for we rest assured, God, that you not only hear our prayers, but you send us answers, too, and for that we're eternally grateful. God, lead our wonderful commissioners this evening, God, and throughout all of their uh, tenure as commissioners, God. Influence their actions, God. I thank you for them personally, Father. They are great and wonderful leaders in our community. God, I pray that you let them find in you unity, Father, so that they may journey together in the things of this great county and not stray away from the truth and what is right, God. Lord, I pray, Father, that none of us, Lord, while we, will, we may never agree on anything, Father, uh, or on everything, God, we can be an example of unity, and I pray that you would create in them an example for others to follow. I am grateful for these wonderful leaders and all the leaders that represent our county and do it well. I pray, God, for each one of these commissioners. I pray for their needs, Father. I pray uh, for their families' needs. 
Uh, I, say, I, I pray too for their, uh, any and all their staff, God, that you would keep them safe and keep their family safe as they might not be distracted from their work and their leading. Father, expand their territory, expand their influence, and oh God, that you would bless them, Father. Give them clarity, God. Give them the wisdom and discernment beyond any natural abilities that, that they possess, God, to make decisions uh, that are best for all of us here in our county. God, stir their hearts and their imaginations as they may see beyond appearances of what is reality and what can be for our county. God, and lastly, I thank you for this, this great county of Newton. I'm grateful to live here together with these wonderful and beautiful citizens here and to live in this time and this age, God. What an opportunity it is for all of us that consider ourselves leaders. Father, it is with gratitude that we ask this of you. God, we know that you are at work in every place and all times. God, we ask this, these things, Father, in the only name who saves, the name who saved me, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 Thank you. If, if, you, will, if you will, sir, lead us in our pledge tonight. Sure. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to this republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank Pastor, you, sir. I want to take this time to say um, if you, thank you for all that you do in this community. Um, I know you've been in this community for a long time. Um, and thank you for launching the New Hope Church. And I got a token of appreciation I want to share it with you. Uh, Thank you so much. Um, Commissioner, before we get going, we do want to say, I uh, recognize that Commissioner uh, Sanders um, is on by Zoom tonight. She is on by Zoom tonight. Commissioner Sanders, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can. Can you guys hear me? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for being on tonight. Um, commissioners, I do have one um, addition before we adopt the agenda tonight. The Serenity House, Mr. Norman Bethay, um, is you here tonight, sir? Yes. Thank you. We want to make, um, he has a presentation that he want to present before the board tonight. We want to make that item 12A. Item 12A. The Serenity House, 12A. With that change, I seek a motion that we approve the agenda, please. Second. The motion by Commissioner Edwards and second by Commissioner Mason. Any discussion? All in favor? Commissioner Sanders? Aye. It passes 5-0. Thank you so much. Next is citizen comments. This is an opportunity that we allow citizens to make comments about agenda topics only. Agenda topics only. You have three minutes to do so. Please state your name and your address for the record, please. Agenda topics only. You may come at this time. First thing I was able to grab, hopefully I can see with them. Okay, Annette Alston, um, with Concerned Citizens, Newton County. I, I'm, what, I heard the pastor say, what can be? Stretch your imaginations to see what this county is capable, what it truly can be. And with all due respect to Mr. Cooper, who I believe is probably a fine 
person. He just is not the right person for this position, according to what's on this paper, which basically shows the qualifications of both of these in individuals. And we did not get any real answer from you. Um, over the last couple of weeks, I tried to talk to you. I think you were concerned about respect, and I give that. Um, but we didn't get any real answer as to why the disparity, with the disparity between the two people, why you chose Cooper over Lucinda um, Babbers. And I think the people here deserve that. Your constituents deserve an answer to that. And so we're on record asking you to rescind your vote for Harold Cooper and please consider, reconsider um, Babbers. I, I, one person said that he had human rights experience and, and that he might, I mean human um, resources experience and he may have had that experience, but according to this, he's never even hired a staff before. Um, Ms. Babbers has. Um, he's not held public meetings with constituents, Ms. Babbers has. Um, federal related government management experience, um, she has that, he doesn't. State re related government management experiences, she has that, he does not. Um, grant writing experience, save us a whole lot of money. I think we spend $10,000 every time we get a grant done. Um, he, she has that, he, he doesn't. Um, not to speak of the years of experiences that, that experiences she's had. Now, you've all seen this, you all have this. So we're just trying to figure out, I mean, like why? So we, we have to be on record because you actually, des we deserve that from you. You know, we are your constituents, you serve all of us. And um, we have a right to know how and why you would make a decision so blatantly discriminatory. And so, um, and yes, I, I did say that um, it's because it's just um, concerning. Um, it smells of misogyny. Uh, uh, Mr. Edwards, I hate <coughs> to say this, and I know I'm running out of mo moments, but um, you said something about demeanor um, in regard to her. And I, I mean, I'm like, what, what were you expecting? Were you expecting her to come with her hat in hand and Thank was you. she not bowed low enough? I, I just Thank don't understand. Thank you, ma'am. And, and I'm, so I'm just trying to get some answers because um, this just does not make Thank sense to us. Thank so you. please clarify, we, we ask clarification. Anyone else, please? Anyone else? Good evening, please state your name, your address for the record, please. Yes, my name is Dania Bernard. I'm at 13107 Vista Lane in Covington, Georgia. Thank you. Okay, this is in regards to the downtown consumption district. There can be no significant change in the community unless we have the courage to change our perspectives. In order to change our perspectives, we must first believe we can. We're aware of the various socioeconomic benefits that the downtown consumption district will bring to Newton County, but have we considered that there may be unleveraged wisdom to be mined from the qualitative data that we'll receive from a social experiment of this nature? This is an open invitation to gain valuable insights on an emerging demographic of residents that are migrating to Covington, which is young professionals like myself. Understanding trends, our interests, and behaviors will deliver key insights to the city of Covington to inform their efforts to stay relevant, generate interest in their initiatives, and meet the needs of a new generation of residents. We can either win or learn, but we will never lose. Let's be realistic about our expectations. There are several factors, including effective management, community support, and clear regulations that, if implemented properly, the downtown consumption district could bring numerous benefits to the city and its residents. Of course, there are potential risks, but no system can guarantee complete safety. We will learn to proactively mitigate risks in a controlled drinking environment. 
I heartily encourage you to remain open and curious about ways to enhance the quality of life of for local residents and tourists. Social experiments like the 90-day trials open doors to opportunities that create a more vibrant and economically viable downtown area. Being uncomfortable in trying things that are unfamiliar is the birthplace of innovation. The idea of the 90-day trial is perversely counterintuitive for some people, and that's okay. The measure of our lives is determined by what we achieve, not, what, not by what we achieve for ourselves, it's determined by what we contribute to our community. Let's work together to unlock wellsprings of positive opportunities like never before. Thank you so much. All right. Can I have a copy of that for the record, please? Thanks. Anyone else? Thank you so much. Good evening, I'm Dr. Alfred Dow, 107 George Street here in Oxford. Um, and I rise to speak on behalf of uh, an endorsement for Mr. Harold Cooper. And I have to admit, I, I was a little curious and I kind of pulled up your agenda and kind of perused the agenda. And someone that's kind of intimately familiar with civic duties and public work and uh, even elected office, I found it refreshingly familiar to see things that you're considering with respect to economic development. And, zoning ordinances and still some of the prevailing ramifications that's occurring as a result of COVID, whether it's fiscal, whether it's mental health, whether it's actual medicinal. Uh, and I began to believe or began to just kind of review some of the characteristics that I've known from Mr. Cooper in the three years that I've been here. And it struck me that uh, some of the skills that he have are still transferable, not just for the leadership for this county, but for in fact, uh, and candidly, every profession that he would entail. It's important for a county manager to consider really three pertinent things. One, what's the best possible solution for our citizens, as best as we can make them as elected officials? Two, what are the most prudent options? And three, what are the ramifications for those options? Many times we, we tend to forget that the most important part of all of the agenda that we review in every, every county, every city, in every jurisdiction, is that citizen comments part. That's the part that we have to attune our ears, we have to listen a little bit more attentively. In fact, that's where all the good ideas come from. I looked at your thought of the day, and it talked about the gate uh, of change being open from the inside, but I would challenge that to tell you that sometimes those thoughts need to come from the outside. But when those thoughts come, you want someone that's skilled, you want someone that's thoughtful, and you want someone that's deliberate and has the right temperament. For if good ideas come and they're not received by a leader with the right temperament, they may in fact uh, be missed and we may miss opportunities. One of the greatest characteristics I have uh, witnessed <clears throat> about Mr. Cooper and one of the greatest compliments I can offer you to, on his behalf is I've never seen him in inappropriate. He's never flat-footed. He's gonna always have the right temperament to listen fairly, judiciously, uh, and, 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 and evenly for all the citizens. But more importantly, he's gonna make the most thoughtful decision, not only for the present time for Newton County, but for its future. Given the current political climate we have in our world today, my hope, my prayer, is that you would embrace having the thoughtful leader, thoughtful leadership of the most quiet man in the room, Mr. Harold Cooper. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Good evening. Joseph Reed. You know, I listen to everybody, you know, and I've, <clears throat> I've been around this town for a long time, you know, and, uh, and I hear, you know, we talk about being Christians and stuff. And, and you know, the life that I came from, you know, I, I have to walk this life. You know, I can't play uh, with it. You know, it don't matter, you know, who it is. You know, I believe everybody deserves a fair chance. And I believe we need to know, regardless if it's wrong or right, I believe we need to know why, you know. And we're talking a lot about economic development, prospering this town, drinking on the square, 
But I don't hear nobody really concerned about how we're losing our kids right now. You know what I mean? I don't hear nobody even talking about that. We don't, I don't hear y'all even voting on it. How we're losing our kids. We're losing all kind of kids. You know what I mean? But we are not talk, we're talking about economic development. So we're losing our kids in an economic development of growth in our kids. We're losing all our kids at, at, a, at a astonishing rate that we don't even want to look at. None of us want to look at. You know what I mean? We don't even talk about it. So, you know, when are we going to, so to, to me, it's about change of attitude. You know, and we talk about spirit, you know, Holy Spirit and stuff. Where is it at? You know what I'm saying? Where, where's our hearts at, man? When we're losing all these kids in all kinds of different ways. We, go, we up here fighting like we are kids. You know what I'm saying? But we're not looking at how we're losing all these kids. <clears throat> Nobody's doing it. Anyone else? Good evening. Good evening. My name is Calvin Horton. I am a resident of Newton County, uh, District 4. I'm here to speak on behalf of Mr. Harold Cooper. And I've known Harold Cooper for quite a, some time. And I know that he, in order to perform the duties of the county manager, I feel comf comfortable and confident that he is very capable of handling the responsibilities that would be put upon him. Now his skill set and his background align with the requirements for this position as county manager. So that means that all of the boxes check off on Mr. Cooper. But it's one thing that we probably are not aware of in reference to Mr. Cooper his characters, one of his character sets. And that is that of a caring person. A, he has and possesses a caring spirit. Now, I am a former or retired educator. And I know that each day that I went into the classroom with that caring spirit, spirit I just wanted to experience a high degree of success. Now, caring spirit is a special quality or a special asset. Mr. Cooper cares about people. And that's why he has been brought forth here to Newton County to serve the people. And I know that he will serve the people very well. I am very excited about Mr. Cooper becoming my county manager. I've worked with him on community projects here in Newton County, and he has shown true dedication to the, to the Newton County community. So let's keep in mind that he is a caring person. And let me just remind you that change is not all bad. Nobody's going to come into a situation where they had know all of the aspects of it. That's impossible. You have to give individuals an opportunity and a chance to grow. So let's give Mr. Harold Cooper a fair chance. I am very excited. I know that he will do a magnificent job because I know one thing, he has a caring spirit. Thank you. Anyone else? Matthew Huff, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm here to speak on behalf of Harold Cooper as county manager for Newton County. I've known Harold Cooper for over 20 years. He is a man that cares, he's competent, he's order-driven and disciplined. He's a man of moral integrity. He's wise and he's been my trusted counsel over the last few years as we've stood up an organization. He has a degree in psychology and a master's in public management. He is a man that can lead people and personalities, and that's what we need in this position. Harold Cooper is a leader of people. He reminds me of Joseph in the Bible. Joseph 
didn't have all the requirements or didn't have the resume of others. Oh, stop it. Hey, guys, he didn't he, they didn't interrupt you when you was talking opposing, so don't interrupt them while they're talking in favor. You start the back burner. Joseph didn't have the resume and all of the qualifications that everyone else had. He went through challenges in his life, but he was the right person for the job to be the vice president under Pharaoh in Egypt. Harold Cooper is the right person to be county manager for Newton County. He has the skill, the acumen, he has the resolve to lead this county to higher heights. Thank you for selecting Harold Cooper. He is the right man for the right job right now to lead our county forward. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? <clears throat> Hi, my name is Kayla Dobbs. I live in Covington Place. Um, I moved to Covington in 2018, and I have loved becoming a part of this community. And I'm here because um, I really want to implore all of you um, to focus on um, when it comes to the consumption <clears throat> on the square, um, to focus on the facts and data that this 90-day uh, trial period could give us. Um, and instead of uh, making decisions based on emotional or personal, um, make this decision based on data. Make this decision based on what we can actually count, what we can see on paper. Um, we need to look at the actual numbers, we, if, if any. We need to look at the actual happenings during this time, during this trial period, and that would give us those facts. That would give us that data. If there is no trial period, if this is not given, I don't believe that any sound decision can be made that wouldn't be based off emotion and not actual fact. Um, I think we're all in agreement in this room that we want the best for our community. We want the best for our small businesses. We wanna see our community thrive. And I think saying no without trying, saying no without actually seeing um, what it could do for especially our small businesses would be a very big mistake for our community. Thank you. Thank you. We have, we have time for one more person. Anyone else? Anyone else? Last person. Good evening, um, Debbie Harper. I'm a Newton County resident and president of the Newton Chamber. Um, I spoke at the last meeting um, on behalf of the Chamber Board in supporting the open container um, trial period. Uh, we do view this as an economic driver as we have viewed some of the same data that um, Mr. Uh, Malcolm presented to you last time and I'm sure may go back over. So um, on behalf of, of the Chamber and the small businesses, um, we, we would like for you to enter into this 90-day period and approve that so we can gather this data and be um, on a more competitive level with some of our neighboring communities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Guys, it's 7.30. Uh, we're going to get ready to go into our uh, public hearing tonight. Ms. Shane, if you would, please come on up. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Well, good evening, Chairman and Board of Commissioners. We have one um, case for a public hearing today, and it's an appeal case. You gotta click on the screen, maybe. Yeah. I'm so, just excuse me. Okay. 
Please excuse me one moment, Chairman. We have one case today. Uh, it is an appeal case. This was originally heard at the Board of Zoning Appeals. Um, the case number today is APP 23-000003. The original case number that was heard before the BZA is APP 23-000002. Uh, the applicant on file is Simon H. Bloom. The property owner is Peachtree Building Group. They're also the original applicant. And the address is off of Brown Bridge Road. This is the Benton Woods Townhome Subdivision that we are looking at today. Tax parcel is 0043-037. It is in District 4. And the property is on 8.43 acres. It's two phases. Phase 1 has 76 new units plus the 8 existing ones at a time. And Phase 2 is, has a proposed 78 units. Current zoning is multifamily residential, and currently this phase two is vacant and um, undeveloped. So the appeal request, it was an appeal, so an administrative decision to deny the land disturbance permit for Benton Woods Townhome subdivision of phase two. So basically, they initially, they're appealing staff's decision to not allow the LDP to move forward. And the original request was to obtain the LDP permit for phase two subdivision um, without meeting the required number of access points. And the brief history was on 323 of 2023, the BZA denied this appeal to the administrative decision, which was to deny the land disturbance permit. And that number was LDPR 22-000003. And it was for the Benton Woods Townhome subdivision. And this was by votes to the five to zero. The potential effects on the county of allowing the, the, it to move forward as is would be, it would affect the safe ingress and egress from the property in emergency and natural disaster situations. The applicable standards for this, we have um, identified three applicable standards. The first one is taken from our development regulations, it's section 605-100, access management. And this chart is um, C. So 605-100C, and this chart identifies the number of ingress and egress points needed based on size of um, developments. And it's a multifamily residential, and they would need to have at least more than one um, entrance at this time here, so 50 to 200 units. Our second applicable standard is also from the Newton County <coughs> Development Regulations. It is section 415-050, which is the review of construction and development plans. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and read this quickly. So following the approval of the preliminary plat, the developer shall be clear to submit all the construction documents required for a development permit. A development permit shall be issued based on staff review and approval of, it goes through the different things that are required, the tree protection land, Scape plan, erosion sedimentation control, storm water, construction drawings, and so on. And the development permit shall be limited to the area included within the plans and may be further conditioned as deemed appropriate or necessary pending development <laughs> permit approval. The third applicable standard is from the fire marshals. Um, their ordinances, the, the state statutes, it's fire code 503. Um, one, two, which is additional access. I, I'm not gonna read through the entire thing, but I will read the section numbers into the record. So they're looking at um, the fire marshal reviews section 503.12. He also reviews section D107, which addresses one or two family residential developments. And it goes into the requirements that are needed for those um, developments in terms of the number of access points, depending on the number of units that are required. and. Actually, for one or two family dwellings where the number of units exceeds 30, um, that code says that it shall provide you know, two separate and approved fire, um, access roads. And this is included in your packet. <clears throat> it goes through the entire code. So that's the second one. And okay, so those are, yeah, so that's the codes for the fire marshal. So those are the three applicable sections that we are looking at. Uh, conclusions to the findings. So the Benton Woods Townhome subdivision was de-annexed from the city of Covington into the county in 2019. 
The property was subsequently rezoned, and that case is REZ 19-000007. It was rezoned to the RMF, which is a multifamily residential, on 10-15-2019, and the county then applied its own conditions to that property. So the, um, it replaced, essentially replaced what the city had, had earlier in there, when, when it was in the city. So we rezoned it, and then we applied our own conditions on top of that. And included in the conditions of zoning, you had condition 1-3, and these are the conditions that the board set at the time. Attached townhomes shall have a minimum of eight units per acre, minus the 100-year floodplain subject on approval of the Newton County Fire Marshal for the number of allowed entrances. And condition 2-8 that the board put in place at the time was the owner's agreement to abide by the following development standards which was says that all streets shall meet the standards of public streets as specified in Division 605 of the Newton County Development Regulations. And that was the chart that we showed earlier. So after the rezoning, we move forward with a preliminary plat, PPP 20-000002, and this was approved by the Planning Commission on 5-26-2020 with the conditions of the rezoning case above incorporated into it. And preliminary plats are conceptual in nature. This means that by the, by the time you get to the final plat, changes can be made. It's just a concept. The final plat is what is um, upheld um, in court. Uh, it's recorded in the clerk of court, sorry. So the preliminary plat was approved. It showed phase one had a total of 76 town homes that they were proposing, and they had eight that were already existing. And then phase two proposed a total of 78 new town homes given us 162 units total. The Land Disturbance Permit, LDPR 20-00002 for phase one was approved and issued on 11-4-2020. And the final plat, FP 21-00008 for phase one was issued on 6-28-21. So the project is currently at the LDP stage for phase two. And this LDP has not been issued at this time because the applicant has not met the requirements in the condition of zoning, which includes section 605-100C, previously read before, um, in reference to the access points, the required access points. And recommended conditions, should the request be approved, staff recommends the Board of Commissioners approve with the following conditions. Staff would recommend that the Board deny the appeal request due to the failure to satisfy and meet requirements of section 605-100 of the Newton County Development Regulations. And this is an aerial view of the subdivision. So we have phase one in front here and the area highlighted in blue is phase two that is currently under consideration. Current zoning is RMF, which is multi-family residential. This is the overall site plan from the preliminary plan that was presented, the proposed site plan. So um, we have phase one on the right, and then the red is the proposed phase two. This is just a close up um, of the units there and the plan. And uh, this is the end of staff's presentation. If there are any questions, if not, uh, the applicant's representative is here. Thank you. Um, it's 739. We're gonna open it up now for our public hearing tonight. Um, the applicant and those that would like to speak in favor tonight, you have 10 minutes to do so. If you would, please come and state your name, your address for the record, please. The applicant and those that would like to speak in favor tonight. Hi, my name is Andrea Pearson from Bloom Parham on behalf of the applicant. Um, we are here on the administrative appeal for Peachtree Building Group related to the Benton Woods subdivision. Sorry, Sorry. can I just pause my time? My, I have mm -hmm. a PowerPoint as well. Okay, here we go. Okay, so the issue presented here, I'm sorry, it's not. Sorry, can you Brian, pause can it you, for a second? Can you pause the time, please? Sorry, it's, okay. All right, the issue presented here is whether or not staff erred by denying the LDP for phase two due to a lack of second point of ingress and egress, and did the BZA err by upholding that decision? The answer is yes, and the reason why is because Peachtree Building Group has vested rights in approval of phase two of the, prelimin of the LDP. Phase two has been approved repeatedly without a second point of ingress and egress, and Peachtree Building Group has spent millions of dollars in reliance on those approvals, 
and the county had discretion to approve the preliminary plat and the other plans without a second point of ingress and egress under the regulations, such that they essentially can't change the rules now. Um, so as Ms. Applewhite mentioned, this is a layout of the property. You can see phase one has the um, road and then phase two has been graded or partially cleared. Um, you can see the um, tax parcel map showing the different parcels. And here you can see that the development is in the ground. Phase one has been um, started with the building permits and is actively building phase one of the subdivision. The road in question is in um, the top picture and also phase two of the road is also shown as being already cleared. And the issue here is vested rights under Georgia law. So a property owner has the right to develop property pursuant to an already approved development plan when the property owner changes their position and spends substantial sums in reliance of those approvals, both formal and informal, which is exactly what happened here. So there are numerous approvals. As she mentioned, this was already approved by the city of Covington. They issued a land disturbance permit for phase one and phase two. Also issued a final plot for phase one showing clearly only one road here. And that the city of Covington had examined it and said that it was in accordance with their regulations. Um, the rezoning permitted the property to move forward as a residential multifamily. And then after the rezoning, um, Peachtree Building Group purchased the property and began um, development by submitting preliminary plats. The preliminary plat was for both phase one and phase two. This was approved by the Planning Commission. This was also approved by the prior fire marshal. So he, you can see the comments from staff. He reviewed the preliminary plat for phase one and phase two, which only showed one point of ingress of egress and he allowed the development to go forward. Um, so therefore, the preliminary plat satisfied the zoning condition requiring the fire marshal approval because he looked at this and said, okay, you're good to go with the preliminary plat. He said nothing about needing a second point of ingress and egress. Um, this is the preliminary plat clearly showing both phase one and phase two with only one point of ingress and egress. And also this looped road is a different layout which actually assists with um, fire trucks getting in instead of the previous cul-de-sac layout. So here there's actually a way to get around which helps the ingress and egress issue here. So again, this is the fire marshal's review of that prior preliminary plat. And he says, he shows conditions for the preliminary plat and none of them mention a second road or a second point of ingress and egress. And he's, he specifically recognizes the issue and approves the preliminary plat despite the lack of a second entrance. So he recognized that this was an issue and said, you guys are okay to proceed. Staff now is basically trying to get a second bite of that apple, but they really can't do that under Georgia law. Um, the effect of the preliminary plat here is that it is an expression of approval of the layout submitted on the preliminary plat. So when looking at the preliminary plat, you're looking at, okay, the way this subdivision is designed, including the access points, is this okay to proceed to the next phase? And they said yes, even though there was only one road. Um, again, after the preliminary plat, there were additional variances that were granted. There was actually a final plat and that the development director looked at it and said, this is in compliance with our development regulations and the zoning ordinance, and she approved it. So this is, again, this also shows only one point of ingress and egress, and it also clearly contemplates the second phase of development. And in reliance on these, addition, these approvals over and over, Peace Chief Building Group, they purchased the property in reliance on the LDP from Covington, the final plot from Covington, and the rezoning from Newton County. And they purchased it for $1.8 million, or approximately, for phase, only for phase two, over $500,000 for phase one. They've spent over $400,000 in development costs, including engineering for phase one and two. They've spent more than $13 million in development and construction, including construction related to both phases. 
an additional approximate $34,000 in development cost surveys and attorney's fees for phase two. And I guess, you know, considering those photos, you can appreciate given the narrow layout of the property, now that phase one has been constructed, there is no way to construct phase two with the second point of ingress and egress. So giving them the approval and the final plot for phase one saying, go ahead and build these houses means they can no longer construct this any other way. So they gave that approval and they, Peachtree Building Group, clearly relied on it. Um, and staff has mentioned the development regulations, uh, multiple. So 605-100, if you see in footnote two, it specifically provides the staff and the fire marshal with authority to um, vary and modify these rules. They allow them to change the number of lots needed for the access points. And that is exactly what happened here. The fire marshal knew this issue existed, and he said, okay, I'm okay with the preliminary plot. I'm okay with the final plot for phase one. There's also um, the International Fire Code actually allows for modifications. So it is also provides discretion to allow it to go forward with only one point of ingress and egress. Um, and we would also, we believe this is more properly characterized as a single family as opposed to multifamily um, development. Um, and if the um, subdivision is not allowed to proceed to phase two, you know, Peace Street Building Group will suffer real and actual damages, and we believe that it will violate um, their constitutional rights as well. There's a neighborhood just right next door that's over 30 houses that has only one point of ingress and egress, um, also will result in the taking, and we've mentioned that in our letter as well. So that is essentially the outline of what I have. I don't know if anybody has any specific questions for me. Thank you. Would you like to rem uh, uh, retain your two minutes and 12 seconds, ma'am? Ma'am, would you like to keep your two minutes and 12 seconds for rebuttal? Uh, yes, sir. All right, thanks. Now we want to open it up for those that would like to oppose. You have 10 minutes to do so. If you would, please come and state your name and your address for the record, please. Anyone would like to oppose? Anyone would like to oppose tonight? A portion of our public hearing is closed. Um, it's half away. Uh, Mr. District Four. District Four. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do have a few questions. I'm not sure if you're there yet. Okay, give me one second. Let me um, let me get Commissioner Henderson on the floor first. Commissioner Henderson. You know, since we are doing it like this, let's, yeah, let's I'm gonna let you guys ask questions first before we get a motion. Go ahead. Yes. Um, Ms. Applewaite, I know we, there was a lot of talk about the two uh, <coughs> entrance, the exit and entrance. And so, and I know they did a lot, of, got a lot of stuff did through the city of Covington, through that zone, and, and then they, and then they just changed and said, we want to go up, um, we want to be done under the county rather mm -hmm. than the city. And it was, and from what I understand and the property I've seen, that was kind of somewhat dropped in our hands for us to kind of make a decision for all those townhouses and stuff to be built with, with just one entrance and exit all in one. Do you think, I mean, and I guess, did the planning commission consider the fact that uh, there was only one entrance and exit? And what did they say if they said anything? The Board of um, Zoning Appeals that it was initially heard um, in front of, they voted to uphold uh, staff's decision to not um, release the land disturbance permit at this time. Um, this project did come over from the city of Covington. It, um, the property was de-annexed, but then the county went ahead during the rezoning process to put its own conditions in place. So those would supersede. And those are the conditions that um, the project is operating under currently. And in those conditions, the requirement was there for them to meet the required number of entrances and exits. 
recommendation was to deny. The BZA, yes, sir, the BZA. So, so they upheld staff's decision in essence. Okay. Thank you. Well, let me get Commissioner Sanders before you make a motion. All right. Uh, Commissioner Sanders. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Applewhite, can you tell me how many homes are currently in the actual subdivision and once these homes possibly be added, how many total? They have um, completed phase one, which had a total of, one moment please, seven to six houses um, plus eight existing homes. And then phase two is proposed to have 78. Just one moment, Commissioner, let me just pull it up here. Okay, thank you. I'm actually gonna go back on this here, Brian. She's at the fridge. So um, it's a total of 162 units in both phases. If um, phase two is completed, phase one has a 76 units, um, well, plus eight additional ones. And then phase two is proposed to have 78 units. Okay. My concern with this, and we all know the issues in uh, the, on the west side of Newton County, Brown Bridge Road is a busy intersection. Has a traffic study been done? Not for this subdivision, uh, Commissioner. Okay. It has to meet so the, as uh, you know, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry. Um, as we know, um, I currently stay in a subdivision with one entrance and we have issues where if there is a accident on that road, the residents are stuck because they have only one entrance to get in and out. And that's also on the west side of Newton County. We've had houses that actually burned down because of fire department could not get to that specific area because there's only one entrance. We've had people who've actually died, um, had heart attacks because EMS could not get to them on, a, on time because there's only one entrance in that subdivision with a certain amount of homes. So that is my concern and possibly why the planning commission probably denied it because if they live on the west side or see what happens on the west side, if you live in the area, you understand. And so having not having that other access point is a safety hazard. And it's an issue for people who live in the community who are looking for EMS, fire services, police to get to them on time in a timely manner. And if those, that main one intersection road is blocked off, guess what? Somebody can possibly die like happened in my subdivision. A house can burn down. If they all have to get out at one time and the only access is they have that one entrance point in Brown Bridge Road, that's an issue. So I comply or I pledge to a plea to my, my commissioners to consider that, my colleagues to consider that because I live in a subdivision where we're now currently trying to get the second entrance open with a whole bunch of units. So that is the issue is safety. It's not wanting the developer to move forward with, with various units. We do have things in place with the county, but it's for safety. And we're about to build more homes, especially on that end, end part of Brown Ridge Road and Crow Road, 500 units and apartment complexes. So I want us to think also about the future of what's coming on that one main road. Let's think about the safety of the people. Thank you. Commissioner Mason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do too also live on the west side of the county and uh, since being in office for the past uh, four years, going on five years, the residents uh, in District 2 on the western side of the county uh, have made that uh, known that they would like to see uh, there being more than one entrance or exit. Uh, there has been several times, uh, even though uh, my subdivision uh, has over 500 homes uh, in the subdivision, and there's one way in, one way out. It's not even on a main uh, thoroughfare, but even though it's not on a main thoroughfare, it's still, if there is an accident or if there's something that occurs, uh, now people are having to try to come out of that one exit, uh, an entrance, uh, and try to take a back dirt road to try to get out to prevent uh, from being stuck there. So I, I do know that that can be uh, an issue uh, from what I'm hearing thus far uh, in regards to that. And I, I've seen several uh, subdivisions on the western side of the county that do have one entrance and one exit out. Uh, and so it sounds to me that that has become uh, a p potential matter. So, I, I, and I guess my question is, uh, I, and I, I saw the numbers on how much uh, 
monies have been spent thus far, uh, what would the expense be uh, to have a new egress or ingress uh, into this other piece of the subdivision uh, to kind of help with, you know, safety, you know, our uh, police and fire and things like that getting in and out, um, what would that, ex ex that cost or that expense be? Um, and once again, that could be a reason why, because that has been an issue on the western side of the county, uh, why uh, our planning department probably looked at it from that perspective. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, I know I've heard Commissioner Sanders speak several times, particularly as it, as it relates to the western side of the county and now Commissioner Mason as well, that our um, subdivisions in the past have been developed with the, the single point of entry and exit. So um, I believe um, it's been made loud and clear that that is a, a concern of ours in the county moving forward. And the fact that we have those existing subdivisions now, um, uh, the neighboring subdivision uh, only has one entrance. Uh, if, I'm not saying we did, but if we, if we erred in making those one in and one out entrances at that time, it does not mean we continue or we repeat those same issues um, as we move forward in the development of our county and, and building out uh, property. So uh, that's, that's kind of, I'm not going to be in favor of this at all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Cowan, and then Commissioner um, Henderson. I have a question for the OK. Ma'am, if you would, please come up. Andrea Pearson. A uh, quick question. I'm looking at the approval date on the resolution right after the, I guess, your owner, your client bought the property, October 15, 2019. And then there was a subsequent planning commission uh, document prepared 5-26-2020. You correct for me with that? Yes, that is correct. They actually purchased the property following the rezoning. Okay. Item two says, and I suppose this was condition, these were conditions, says to the owner's agreement to abide by the following development standards, all streets shall meet the standards of public access as defined by Division 605 of the Newton County Development Regulations. Is that correct? Um, I'm not, are you looking at the, re I do believe that is an accurate, um, yeah, it's right here. I got it. yes, of the, re of the reason. Uh, condition. So not developing a separate access is not in compliance with their agreement. Is that correct? So our position is that the new, I, I don't want your okay, position. Sorry. I asked you a question. Can got you it? repeat the question? The question was, is this a breach of that? condition no, not in our no sir I don't well, believe why so. not um, because the development regulation 605 100 permits the director and the fire marshal to provide modifications and variances from okay, that we rule. have changed directors and fire marshals since that time correct and those directors now, if they made a mistake, there's not, it's not right to perpetuate a mistake, is it? Would you agree with that? As a general matter, I agree, but I do not agree that this is a mistake because the regulations permit that. I think it's a that. mistake. I think it's a mistake, and I'm not in support of it. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Henderson. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just let me say this, you know, and I, I heard what everybody said, but I don't think that, you know, he's one person on this board who would agree as far as I have an entrance and an exit separate. And and I just wanna say this, I don't I don't think nobody would want to approve a second phase without that. And if you've been there on Brownbridge Road and I've been there now as a uh, <clears throat> elected official for several years and I know how congested it is. 
and we don't wish that on nobody. In occasion, you see the uh, little uh, crosses um, that are placed on the side of the road where someone, loved one, has had an accident for whatever reason, and it's not good. So, you know, I said, it, said all that just to say this, and I think, you know, I think everybody said it maybe in a little bit different way on the board, is that we're going to, uh, and at least I know that I am, I'm going to go with the uh, Planning Commission rec recommendation, which is to, to deny. Is there a second? Second. second. It's been motioned by uh, Commissioner Henderson and second by Commissioner Mason. Um, you want to stay with just for the record, can we um, confirm that the motion is to deny the uh, LDP permit for Benton Woods um, and uphold the B BZA's decision to not approve the LDP permit? Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> As stated by the uh, county attorney. Thank you, sir. Is your second, your second still stand, sir? Yes. It's been motioned by um, Commissioner Henderson and second by <laughs> Commissioner Mason. Any more discussion? All in favor? Commissioner? Aye. Thank you. It passes 5 0. Thank you. Um, Chairman, this brings us to the end of the public hearings. Do you want me to go into the other three items that I have tonight? Go ahead. Okay. <coughs> so um, the next item for this is just for consideration for the board. It's not a public hearing. And it is, um, oh, sorry. It is an intergovernmental agreement um, to share responsibility for the implementation of certain NPDES permit control measures with the city of Covington. So basically the city of Covington is working on the east side sewage system improvements. It is a land disturbance permit that the county um, has reviewed um, for the LDP permit. Um, we do have a person that also does the inspections for that, but the city is asking to be allowed to take um, the primary role in that and to do the inspections themselves. Um, of course, in accordance with county guidelines. So the project is linear and it weaves in and out of city and county properties. And that's why they're asking um, to just have them go ahead and just complete the inspections as well for this project. And we did complete an intergovernmental agreement and it is included in your packets. And that is what is here for consideration before you. I do have uh, Mr. Mike Willis from the city of Covington here in case uh, the board has any additional questions that they would like to ask. Thank you. Board, I'd seek a motion, please. Commissioner Cowell. Uh, thank you, Shana. Uh, is the city going to accept responsibility for negligence due to a faulty inspection? Yes. Okay. You making that in the form of a motion? Hmm? Are you making oh, that in the form? Well, I accept the, uh, I don't know if anybody else had any other questions. No, sir. Okay. Um, I'll accept, uh, make a motion to accept the intergovernmental agreement to share responsibility for implementation of certain NPDES permit control measures with the City of Covington, provided, however, the City of Covington will assume responsibility. You can put that in the document. Uh, or any negligence. Thanks, sir. Is there a second, please? Second. It's been motioned by Commissioner Cowell and second by Commissioner Henderson. Any discussion? Commissioner Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would ask that uh, our, in drafting that intergovernmental agreement, that the county be, uh, work with the city to be very specific on those, on those duties and um, <laughs> Uh, to ensure that no other duties are intermingled or uh, otherwise misunderstood. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Anyone else? All in favor? Commissioner Sanders? Yes, sir. Aye. Thank you. It passes 5-0. Okay, right. Chairman. Uh, the next item we have for the board's consideration. This is also not a uh, public hearing. The department is looking at just um, updating its fee schedule. So this is a resolution of Newton County, Georgia, amending and adopting the Newton County Development Services fee schedule. And it is resolution 0502, 2023. 
And you, this document is in your packet, so I won't read everything out, but basically every item in red is what we are proposing to update. So we do have the new fees we are doing for, um, if it's like a third review of final plat, we do have a small fee that we'd like to propose to attach to that. Um, and these are for the land disturbance permits, and these are the respective um, increases and in fees we're looking at. So we made a slight change here for the permit review fee, as well as to add the new fees for a second and a third and subsequent reviews. Because the, every time these projects come back in with updates um, to be reviewed, it costs the county to have the third, sec, you know, third, fourth, fifth reviews done. So we're just um, trying to recoup some of those costs. And now we just um, slightly updated the review for minor land disturbance as well. Um, this is just the bond language, um, just to add us 100% of the costs, but um, this is pretty much what we have currently uh, using right now. So we just wanted to clarify that. And um, this is just a correction in the uh, a typo that we wanted to correct on the record. This is, these fees are just for the building permit. We, have, um, we are proposing to add a residential building plan review fee. We currently do not charge for the residential review. We don't charge applicants, but um, of course it costs us to have that reviewed. So it's, we're proposing $100 um, per project for that. And then this is, we, the board <coughs> recently approved the mobile and temporary food establishment permit. Could you uh, take a clock down, Brian? And we have to, uh, this is just the permit fee that we will charge is $50, and staff is proposing for this to be an annual fee. So once they have the permit to operate in the county, it should be good for the year. If they are opening, they still have to have a base of operation, and that will be under the regular commercial building permit when they come in for that. So if you open like a restaurant or a commissary kitchen, or they have to have a base where they're gonna prepare the food. So that will be just a regular, um, commercial permit, and then, this, and then this is just gonna be, it's gonna be a regular license, sorry, business license, and then this is gonna be the permit for the, to do the actual event. And those are all the updates we are <coughs> proposing for the board's consideration today, if there are any questions. Thank you. Uh, guys, do you have any questions? I seek a motion, please. Commissioner Cow. I make a motion to approve the new rate schedule as defined by Ms. Applewhite. Is there a second? second? It's been motioned by Commissioner Cowell and a second by Commissioner Edwards. Any discussion? All in favor? Commissioner Sanders? Aye. Thank you. It passes 5 0. In terms of the last item uh, we have, it's just a presentation update for the Newton County Comprehensive Plan. Um, after the board has seen and heard and reviewed it this afternoon. The next step would be to send it on up to the state and to the Northeast Georgia Regional for their review and approval. They will then send it back to us. Either it will be good to go then or they may have recommendations which we will update and then bring the final copy back before the board in June for adoption. Okay. So I do have our um, consultant here, Mr. Kalanis Johnson who is going to make that presentation, and I will be available along with him with any questions. <clears throat> Thank you for being here tonight, sir. <clears throat> uh, good evening, good Kalanis evening. Johnson, Goodwin Mills and Kwood, 801 Broad Street, Suite 900, Augusta, Georgia, 30901. Uh, Mr. Chairman, fellow commissioners, good evening again. Uh, we're here tonight to give, as uh, Shana just mentioned, to give you an update uh, where we are with the, um, I guess, the draft for your comprehensive plan. And basically, tonight after this presentation, uh, you guys will vote to transmit it forward, as she mentioned, to your uh, Northeast Georgia uh, Commission as well as DCA. Uh, some of this you've seen before. I'll go through this again. I won't have been a long night. Uh, you outlined for the presentation, again, the introduction of where we are in the process, the, uh, the plan process, how we got to this point. I will summarize public involvement. Uh, we'll talk about the character area map process, uh, the community work program, which is the implementation plan. 
and we will talk about the next steps in the process. Again, this was a nine month process. Um, the elements that you see on the board here um, are DCA required elements, everything from housing, uh, natural resources, intergovernmental cooperation, community facilities, parks, land use, uh, just to name a few. Again, we're following the Department of Community Affairs guidelines. Um, part of this process obviously is setting goals, establishing needs and opportunities, identifying your community work areas, a work plan, and all of this consists of a lot of public involvement. Here is just a graphic of um, a depiction of the overall process. We started with data gathering last year, um, moved into community visioning, a lot of public involvement with that. Uh, we had um, public open houses, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, that community visioning then led to the development of initial goals and strategies, which um, led into actual action items, which led into the implementation plan and the work program, which is where we are now. Um, this is a pretty uh, a good graphic to let you know that we're not starting from scratch. There are several outputs, sources that go into this comprehensive plan. You had a plan uh, in 20, um, 2019. Some, some of the information in there was still relevant. That was a source. We also had quantitative data analysis, growth trends, population projections. Uh, we had permits. We had uh, the open houses that I mentioned. We had stakeholder interviews. We had online public surveys. And for the regular um, and one for the youth as well. These are some of the inputs that went into the comprehensive plan. Population projections, very important. Um, again, between 2020 and 2030, your population is projected to increase uh, up to 136,000 by 2030. Uh, this will be a growth rate of approximately 21%. Likewise, the next 10 years, between 2030 and 2040, your population is expected to increase an additional 22,400 um, up to, so your total will be approximately 158. And that would be a growth rate of 16.5%. So as you see, based on projections, uh, your county will continue to grow substantially. Next, talk about public involvement. Again, some of this you've, uh, you've seen before. Um, we had one meeting in each commission district, your five commission districts. We also had one last week, April the 24th. Uh, we also had online community surveys. Everybody were not able to come out to the meetings in person. The surveys were for individuals for various reasons uh, were not able to attend uh, in person. We also had stakeholder interviews and there are a few slides later we'll let you know um, how that, that process and these are individuals that were appointed based on their, uh, their role in the county, their career, whether they were civic involvement, whether they worked with a chamber, developer, so on and so forth. There was also a project, project website that had uh, frequent project updates, um, board of commissioner updates like what we're doing tonight, uh, planning commission updates, which we did last week, and um, a public hearing. Again, we had one of those last week as well. In terms of public outreach, this next slide just shows you an example of some of the materials, some of the items that were used to get the word out uh, for the public. Uh, we use some of your commissioners, your email blasts for your respective districts, uh, your county Facebook posts, as I mentioned, the county website, and flyers that were posted and distributed in various locations throughout your community. Public open houses, uh, November 2022, um, we had them, as you see, uh, five different locations. We had 88 total attendees for those meetings. And here you see some of the comments. And again, we've, some of you've seen this a couple of times now. Um, online community survey, which I mentioned. This survey was out between October 19th and December 16th. We had 296 total respondents to the survey. Um, because of the survey, because of some of the, um, I guess, the, the um, demographics and statistics, we were advised to look at the youth college and high school students, which we did, uh, reached out, coordinated with um, your, your local school board and um, for high school students and was very successful. <laughs> we had almost 800 uh, respondents. Um, a lot of, most of them lived in the county or, excuse me, 50% of them lived in the city of Covington and nearly 40 lived in unincorporated Newton County. And as you can see, some of the concerns and issues which the students uh, chose. 
We also had stakeholder interviews. Again, we interviewed seven stakeholders between December 13th and the 21st of last year. Additionally, we had two in February of this year. They provide excellent insight on the county based on their daily activities. Again, developers, uh, real estate uh, individuals, water sewer authority, uh, individuals that work at uh, colleges and universities. Again, we had just a wide variety of individuals that provided some very good input. And we also had a former commissioner as well as a former planning commission member. The character area map process. A little bit, a little background. What's the purpose of a character area map? Well, it determines the location, physical boundaries for a potential character area. And the character area is looking at unique features, um, development patterns, and, and other features uh, to identify a vision for the future of that area. Uh, we came up with objectives for the area to achieve the vision. Um, we come up with action steps and priorities, which we'll discuss later. And also, we, we prepared development regs or guidelines to help implement those objectives. And overall, for the county, this is something that we heard from the beginning of this process. The county seems to be, in terms of a rural versus urban context, east versus west. You know, housing in certain areas, low density is um, prominent. Other areas, high density is prominent. Life cycle housing was a, a topic that came up a lot uh, throughout this process. We also looked at economic development, small town character areas. Um, individuals wanted mixed use walkable areas. Some wanted neighborhood site or neighborhood uh, specific uh, commercial versus regional commercial nodes. And actually the map we'll show in a little bit will explain that. There was also retail and restaurant areas that uh, came about from this. And we also looked at industrial office and professional spaces as well. Highway 278 corridor. Very important east-west facility for the county, uh, somewhat parallel to I-20. Uh, a lot of potential for development, uh, potential growth boundary as well. And also, you can't do any type of uh, plan in terms of uh, future growth without considerations for your environmental. We looked at your watershed protection. We also looked at open space preservation as well. This next slide just shows a graphical depiction of what went into the character area maps. We had everything from your existing land use map. We looked at your current or your, your current uh, neighborhood character areas. That there were 24 character areas. They were just strictly based on neighborhoods. That was a data layer. We looked at land use, looked at your infrastructure, your water and sewer uh, facilities map, uh, just to name a few. All that went into what you see uh, in front of you now. Uh, we actually have eight particular items. We have a low density rural residential, which is the, the light green. Uh, we have emerging uh, suburban, which is the, the salmon colored. We have the established suburban core areas, uh, conservation recreation, obviously, along your rivers, um, north and south, southern part of the county. We also have a, a few areas that are dedicated for industrial and heavy commercial character. And the teal color, as you see north of the city and um, west of the city of uh, Covington um, and along I-20 as well as 278 live work, live work areas uh, for unique, uh, close, dense development. And we also have community crossroads and village centers, again, nodal concentrated areas at crossroads at major intersections uh, where uh, citizens as well as, you know, the data showed this is where these are key areas for potential growth for the county. This led into the implementation of our community work program. And again, goals, strategies, and, and action items. As we used earlier, a lot of data sources, a lot of inputs went into it, survey, stakeholders, uh, and again, your existing plan. Certain items in your existing plan made sense. Certain things obviously had to be updated because of the time change, but we wanted you to know that you know, there were certain, uh, there are certain qualitative and certain quantitative uh, sources that fed into the development of your goals and your strategies that you will see in the work program. And I guess the question of how does your plan get implemented? Well, as you'll see, there's a table that we'll show in a few slides, but we had to identify the parties, responsible parties to conduct each action. And we identified partnerships. Those actions had to be either with another local government, uh, a private entity, so on and so forth, or Georgia DOT, for example. We also talked about funding streams, identified grant opportunities where appropriate. 
And this work program needs to be updated as circumstances and priorities change. Typically, this can be an annual update. Again, this community work program serves as an operational checklist for goals, objectives, and actions outlined in the community vision section. In essence, this plan won't just sit on the shelf. It's something that you know, it's fluid, can be updated, but this is something you can take and use when it comes to future development um, issues and questions that will come forward. And again, we put this in a user-friendly table, we have timelines, respect, responsible parties, and funding sources, as you'll see. And this is an example, probably can't see some of the smaller font, but this is for housing. And the far left, you have the actual action item, goals. Um, next column, you'll have the projected timeline. Is it considered a short-term issue? Is it intermediate or is it long-term? Um, the priority, is it high, is it medium? Who's a responsible party? Is it your development services? Is it water? Um, is it public works, for example? We also looked at potential partners. Some of these partners may be other jurisdictions. Some of them may be the state, or they could be a nonprofit entity. We also had a column for potential costs um, and funding sources. This next slide is kind of a, a key uh, for some of those items on the previous slide. As you see, we had initials for some of the responsible parties and partners and then we had the dollar signs for uh, estimated costs. And as I mentioned, the timelines for the actual actions to take place. We pulled a few of the, I guess the top, there, there are nine elements, as we mentioned again, the housing, transportation, so on and so forth. We pulled a few of the top ones, ones that probably can be short term items to give you an example of how this will work for housing. We heard from the beginning of the process that Construction design standards was key, was very important. We also heard life cycle housing for all ages um, was something that was needed. And obviously housing for all incomes, workforce housing. Uh, as you guys know, you have a major catalytic uh, development coming with Rivian in your area, and so um, we want to make sure that you all are prepared for uh, items like that. For the transportation element, you guys had an existing transit master plan. Again, certain things you guys had that you wanted to impl implement it, move forward. Um, that should be utilized. Access management principles. One of your cases tonight, we heard the term access management in terms of curb cuts and making sure traffic can flow uh, reasonably without a lot of interruptions. That's something we'll look at. Uh, complete streets policy. Pretty much when developments come in, just don't look at cars, look at sidewalks, look at um, bicyclists and the whole nine. The street is for all users, not just for vehicles. Uh, land use. Again, current codes and ordinances. Again, one of your cases tonight, there was a lot of talk about codes and ordinances and uh, overlay zoning and nodal development. If you remember on that character area map, we had those village and those community centers. Next item, economic development. Very important, working with community partners to expand existing economic development resources. You hear a lot about preparing and recruiting, but what about your existing current businesses? You know, what's in store for them, making sure they're able to sustain as well. Um, I mentioned the incentives, again, to support the expansion of existing businesses, and looking at policies that currently may impede new retail or commercial development. Go back and look at what needs to be tweaked. Intergovernmental cooperation, talk about that a lot. Uh, one of your cases talked about coordinating with the city of Covington, and so, again, joint coordination meetings where appropriate, um, update where needed, your existing service delivery strategy, and just overall communication. You know, that was some, some of the key topics for that particular element. Community facilities and services. Diversify your programs that are offered uh, for all age groups. Make sure that, you know, you're looking at everybody from the youth to the elderly. So, um, and one of the, another action item that was recommended is any county-owned property as a potential location for a new facility. Uh, parks and Rec. Looked at public-private partnerships to improve what you have. And we also looked at, again, an existing study, your master plan that was done by, uh, I think, Los. And so, again, they have some good recommendations. We suggest that you uh, implement those recommendations that are in that plan. Natural, cultural resources. Um, always, the environmentally sensitive areas need to be uh, taken care of. Um, and look at best management practices, you know, mitigation efforts where required. Again, make sure you protect your sensitive features. And finally, um, this is a new element required broadband, just making sure that all areas of your county um, have access to, you know, efficient broadband service. Next step. Whoops. 
All right, so public hearing, planning commission, we had that last week. Uh, board of commissioners meeting, transmittal of the plan, which is what we're talking about here tonight. It will be reviewed by your regional commission and Department of Community Affairs for 40 days. They will, look, they will talk to us and let us know if there's any major comments, they must be addressed. Minor comments can be considered, and we still may address them depending on the nature of those. But as Shana mentioned, we will come back before you all June 30th for the actual plan adoption and submit the final plan to DCA again. Um, are there any questions? That concludes the presentation for tonight. Thank you, sir. Any questions, Commissioner? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Sanders. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, I had the opportunity to speak to DCA at the ACCG convention. I wanted to converse with them to find out more about the comprehensive plan, what we can do here on the county level. And because it's my first comprehensive plan, I wanted a complete understanding. And one of the things they did say that we should make sure that we address all issues, all areas in it before sending it to them, that we don't have to rush to send it to them. Because once it's set, it is set. Um, I had some concerns because a couple of my residents did go to that last public hearing meeting and they were concerned that there was no addressing of parks and rec in the district three area or that surrounding area. Um, parts of that used to be district uh, three, but now it's also two as well. So they were concerned about that box area. There was no, uh, not addressing the parks and rec with that being the most dense area in the county with no parks and recreation for the people and finding out there are more subdivision and condominiums that are being built in that box and there's nothing for those kids to do which crime has been reduced and the reason being which is the reason why i'm in st louis right now is learning all of that from other counties is because there are nothing is nothing for them to do so we i would like for that and i'm not sure how that is actually aligned is to address that in detail because that needs to be done in order to curb crime in order to provide stuff for our youth to do programming and so forth. So that is really, really important. Um, also, you said that you spoke with a uh, former commissioner and staff. Can you inform me of who that former commissioner and staff was or were? It, w it was a planning commissioner member and a um, planning commission chairman and Mr. Landis Stevens. Stevens, thank you. Oh, okay, okay. Um, and also, Speaking for the youth, going back to the youth, I am a big proponent of the youth. I'm an advocate for youth. My concern were the numbers. I think I mentioned that in an email that I sent to uh, the board as well as to the staff in regards to that. And I just wanted you guys to look at the numbers. You said there were 771 responses. Newton High School is almost at capacity. The numbers from last year of Newton High School was 2,478. Alcove last year numbers was 1,905. Um, east side is 1,612. And you also stated that you went to the private school sector and also the colleges. So if the number came back 771, that doesn't represent the youth. And I did, of course, you saw the email. I don't know if you saw the email. I did speak to the communication director. She wasn't aware of it, but she uh, copied the principal on it who said that she did send it to the principals. But there is no documentation or no information if it actually was disseminated down to the youth because there's so many parents who reached out to me and said that their their child or they didn't were not even informed of the survey so my concern is those that are on the in the public school sector have different needs from private school have different needs from uh, those who are in college and as i mentioned those who are in college have already made a decision of whether they're going to stay in the county or not and some of them may not even live in newton and your 11th and 12th graders have already decided if they're going to come back to newton or not because at that point they realize they may not come back because there has not been nothing for them to do so we should have reached out also to the middle school students who are in, in seventh and eighth grade because you want to keep, if you're trying to find ways to keep them here in Newton County, you have to implement those things and start at a younger age so that they can actually tell us what they want to keep us there. So that was my biggest concern is that survey did not reach the masses and certain parts of the town, even with the west side and the east side. Those students on those different sides both have different needs because they have access to different things. So I, I would love for our youth to have a complete voice. I don't know if we can go back and do that. As DCA said, we don't have to rush to send this to them. Make sure it's right before it's actually, we send it back to them. And my other, my last concern, and I'm, I'm gonna be quiet, is you had 88 total attendees for the in-person. And that was because of the time 
but it was at 5.30. I already knew. I told them when it first came out, I already knew we wasn't going to have participation. And I also mentioned before the survey, I looked at the survey, it was so lengthy. If you look at marketing, when you have something too long for people to complete, they won't do it. They may say, I'm going to come back later and complete it. And nine times out of 10, they won't come back. It was very, very lengthy that I knew that a lot of our residents were not going to complete that survey. So creating a comprehensive plan for five years with not enough data, it really concerns me because we did not reach the masses. And also talking to residents on social media, there's a large group on social media with a lot of residents from Newton County. They did not give feedback because they said that they're, they, they feel like their voice doesn't count. They've, they've given feedback and in the, in the comprehensive plan is completely different from what they have given. So I would love for us to try to reach the masses maybe another time in a frame or something. Um, I'm, I'm open to assisting with the marketing uh, of getting that, that word out and, and helping reduce our survey and reaching our kids. If I have to volunteer my time and go into schools and ask the principals if I can come in their classrooms and give them that survey to do it, I, I am open. I just wanna make sure that we are reaching the masses of our community because this five-year plan is important for our growth here in Newton County. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm, thank you. Um, anyone else? Uh, Commissioner Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So no matter the, the, the outcome of tonight's vote to send this on to the Northeast Georgia Regional Commission, it comes back here, scheduled to come back here June 30. Is that correct? Uh, it will be before June 30, yes, sir. It has to be adopted by June 30. Yes. So we try to catch it for the yeah, final. Can you, can you talk um, yeah. Thank you. We're um, aiming to bring it back at least to the final, the second meeting in June. Uh, which is the third Tuesday for adoption. Um, if that day doesn't work, we would have to ask for a special call meeting to have it adopted, but it has to be done before uh, June 30th. And the DCA requires 40 days to review it, which is why we have to send it out um, after this meeting. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, what's your pledge, board? I seek a motion. I make a motion to approve, send it over to DCA. Can I get a second? Can I get a second? That motion failed for a lack of support. Is there another motion? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we revisit our comprehensive plan data to make sure we're reaching all of the residents. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know what the exact time would be before we send that to DCA so we can make sure every resident in Newton County is counted. I know we can't reach everybody, but um, at least a percentage of the people in Newton County is counted to give information before we send that to DCA. Uh, is there a second? Shannon, can you go ahead? Go ahead, second. Commissioner. Second. Um, I don't know. I, Commissioner, can you state your motion one more time? Yes, sir. I make a motion for us to go back and revisit the data that was presented so that we can reach the residents of Newton County, possibly setting another time frame um, versus 530. Um, if we have to just do one mass, uh, feedback for them to come in to do that and also may possibly also go back to reach our youth to make sure we are including those in the public school sector on this survey. So I'm asking my motion basically is to us to go back and revisit the data to make sure we have enough of our residents included in this comprehensive plan. Is it, and it's, it, hold on. it's been motioned by Commissioner Sanders and second by Commissioner Henderson. Uh, discussion. What's the, the, Shana, the time, the time frame? Can you give us the time uh, frame? If I may, Chairman, yes. The DCA does not um, allow extensions, so we have to adopt a plan um, by June 30th. Um, and just to, hold, I'm hold, sorry, Chairman, I don't wait, want to speak out wait, of order. I can't see. Yeah, hold, on so one sec, hold on one second. Go ahead now. Um, I think there may be room for us, even if we were to um, send out the youth survey again, we, we can do that while you know it's being reviewed up there and then just send up the updates to them. But we do have to make that 40 day review deadline as well, which is coming, which will be shortly after this meeting. But we can. Um, ask, ask a question. 
I mean, can we say it again? Yeah, ask your question. If you, you know how this goes. Commissioner Mason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So can we, uh, as you recommended, Shana, um, if we are still to um, go ahead and forward it to DCA and to the Northeast Regional Commission, but in process of doing that, are we able to send that survey out again um, to uh, the masses and to the youth so that we can get that input and, and they will allow us to submit that data while they're in process of review? Yeah, and I believe we can submit the updates as we get it to them, yeah. As long as it's within the 40-day window. As long as it's within the 40-day window is what we're being advised. Okay, so how quickly would we be able to get that survey out to the masses again? Like, you have to write it in? No, we have a survey. We yes. can just give it to you. The survey, uh, they already actually have the survey. Okay. Um, we, we coordinated with uh, some of your county um, leadership, um, chairman of um, – some of your stakeholders actually helped us to actually d disseminate it. But, yeah, we can just send a survey to, to the staff, and yeah, that's something we can just email it, and they can just try to, you know. But the issue is that you don't want to miss that deadline, that, right. that uh, DCA deadline in terms of the 40 days and all. So while they're reviewing it, yeah, if you wanted to do another survey to the youth or to send that same one out again, that's not a problem. And worst case scenario, um, which I, I'm sure this board is not planning to do anything to mi miss that deadline, what happens if we do miss that deadline? We could lose, we could lose our um, qualifying local government status if we don't um, can you make say, that deadline. Can you repeat it again? We can lose our local qualifying um, government status. Um, that will affect us getting funds and grants and so on. Um, so that's why we have to have it adopted you know, by that June 30th deadline. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Sanders. Um, and this is directed to uh, Director Applewhite. Do you have connections with DCA? Because they gave me their contact, and this came directly from them. I spoke directly to the managers, and they stated that we did not have to rush to get it in. So if we can, if you all can reach out to them to see what the time frame we have if we're trying to do something correctly, because I did mention about the survey, um, and, and they said, do not send it to us if it's not ready. So maybe we need to reach out to DCA to see what the additional time frame we have because I, that came from their mouths. I, was, I just spoke to them last week at the ACCG convention. Um, and also the survey, if we can look at that survey, it, it's very lengthy. And to the average person who is taking that survey, they're, not, they're gonna get tired in the midst of taking it. And I believe that's why we got the numbers we received. Um, Chairman or Comm Commissioner, are we asking to redo both surveys or just the youth survey? Um, the, the youth survey, but we didn't get a response from the taxpayers. We got 290 people out of 115,000 residents we have in Newton. Yes, ma'am, but it, it was available um, for anyone who wanted to take it. And we yeah, that's out there for I'm a few sorry. weeks. I'm sorry, that's why I mentioned, I don't, I don't know if you heard what I, I, was, I was stating, the survey was very lengthy and statistically and marketing, when you provide something that's too long for somebody to complete, they normally will not complete it. The average person will not complete it. They'll get tired to the survey and push it to the side and say, I'm gonna come back later. And they possibly, nine times out of 10, like I said earlier, they will not complete it. I said that when the survey first came out, I mentioned that to you. I said, this survey is very lengthy. We're not gonna get a lot of people to complete it. And I, I knew that from the mark from my marketing experience. I, I knew that. That's motion on the floor. Um, no more discussion. All in favor? Aye. All opposed. That motion failed 3-2. Can I get a motion on the floor, please? Commissioner Edwards. Mr. Chairman, this time I'd like to make a motion that we pass this on to Northeast Georgia Regional Commission and the DCA for approval. And commissioners at, in, the, in, in the interim uh, they make sure that they are comfortable and make their suggestions to through Miss Applewhite uh, during that time frame, so that we are aligned and uh, 
um, prepared for the for the next vote at least by June 30th, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. There's been motion by Commissioner Edwards and second by Commissioner Mason. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Abstention. Um, it passes, my reason. It passes oh. um, um, three, two, two abstentions. Commissioner Henderson, you want to state why? Ladies first. <laughs> Thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, my reason being, I don't think the plan is ready. I don't think our residents have been counted and their voice has been heard, nor have our youth been heard. So we definitely want our taxpayers to be involved in a five-year plan regarding the growth of our community. It's very important that we reach them and use our marketing media to make sure that we reach our residents. That's our job, our duty, to make sure they're included in everything that we do. So I, I, I abstain because I don't disagree with us sending it to the next party, but I disagree that we have not, we should be sending it because we have not reached the masses. Thank you. Commissioner Henderson. <clears throat> Uh, thank, thank you. Mine is just short, and I'm just sweet, <laughs> short and sweet. I don't want nobody to feel like that we have, may have left them out and that we gave everyone the opportunity to uh, kind of voice in this, in their opinion. Thank you. So it passed 3 2. Thank you, Chairman. That is all tonight from Development Services. Thank you so much. Ms. Hamp. Yes, Chairman, we are on item number six, which would be under the Chairman's report. Do you have anything this evening? I don't have anything tonight. Okay, the next item on the agenda is unfinished business, item number seven, tabled from April 18th, 2023, a discussion and consideration for resolution number R041, 823 Newton County, Georgia, approval of certain special events within the City of Covington Historic Downtown Entertainment District. Mr. Ken Malcolm is here. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Chairman. Good evening, uh, Commissioners. Um, I, as, as I was, uh, I was here a few weeks ago in the last meeting, uh, this item was tabled. Um, uh, Commissioner Sanders uh, wanted more information about uh, security and specifically uh, how, how Sheriff Brown felt about uh, allowing um, adult beverages on the uh, green space, the center of our square. I know he's here tonight and uh, um, if, if I could you know, ask him if he would sure. like to address the commissioners. Sure. Chairman Baines. Good evening. Commissioners, Clerk, Ms. Nolly. It's good to see you all and it's always good to be here. Uh, Chairman, I'm wondering how this got out to the community. And I believe it was added onto the agenda, is that right? How what got out? Pardon me? How what got out? I, I said, I believe this was added on to the agenda tonight. Is that right? No, sir. It, is it an item? Okay. Anyway, I'm wondering how it got out so widely in the community. I, I received several calls from different ones out in the community, so I assumed they was paying more attention to the agenda than I. But however, um, I received calls from the faith-based community and, and, and many citizens concerned about the county portion of the square not so much of the sidewalks, but the county portion of the square. And after receiving the number of calls, and in my mind of minds, I'm not clear on the beginning and the ending of this. No one has really had a conversation with me uh, about this matter. 
I talked briefly with uh, Chief, Chief Bradford, and that was the extent of the conversation. I shared with him some of my thoughts. But after sharing with him some of my thoughts, uh, I began to believe that it was time to put a pause button on the county portion of the square and keep the consumption to the sidewalk and allow the 90 days to be in place there on the city sidewalks. And let's see how that's going to work. and let's keep it out of the county part of the square. We have a, a number of jurisdictional issues that we would need to work out, and I don't even know if that's something that's attainable right now at this particular junction. Uh, it may be a good concept, but there's issues between the city and county, and particularly the attorneys, even if it was to move forward, that it would need to be worked out. Again, jurisdictional issues. And I'm not going to go into those. Uh, Mr. Macklin should be very familiar with that. And there are many other factors that we should consider before even considering open containers in the county part of the square. I think Mr. Malcolm is probably familiar with the all-out brawl just a few weeks ago over in the parking lot over at the park and ride. And many of those individuals, and I'm not uh, putting fingers on just anyone in particular, but my concern is the inner part of the square should be a safe zone. Let's try the 90 days on the sidewalk. The square should be, again, a safe zone for our families, for our kids, so they can run and play, even with the dogs. They should be able to play without fear of encountering someone who is, is intoxicated. And I believe if we open the door to allow that in the middle of the square, you're going to have the sidewalk and all, also the middle of the square with a number of intoxicated individuals. How do we manage that? Who enforce it? As I said, there's a number of factors that should be looked at, but I submit to you tonight, I believe, that that portion of the square, it should be sacred and it should be a refuge for our families and our safe zone for our families. A concern that came to me, yes, we can wash off the sidewalks, but we cannot wash off the smell and the odor of beer on the grass and the lawn there inside of the county square. That's my position. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mackle. <clears throat> At the last meeting, uh, we presented to you a, a comprehensive plan that addressed every issue that uh, we could foresee. Um, we uh, are, again, our office, the Community Development Department, is only asking for a trial basis. This is not a change in, 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 in an ordinance or anything like that. It's just a study uh, period uh, to allow, you know, the data to support, um, you know, what should, go, what should happen next. I, I, ha I share the same concerns that all of you have. Is, is this right for our community? Is this the best thing for our community? Uh, this is a plan that has been tried and tested in many other communities. This is something that every community surrounding us right now is, is, is doing, is uh, they uh, adopted, you know, a similar template to uh, experiment to see if this would be right for our community. This has 100% um, support from our city council. It has support from the Downtown Development Authority. It has support from the Newton County Chamber of Commerce as being a, uh, a project that could benefit uh, the entire community. 
uh, our downtown businesses uh, that we you know desperately need to do what we can to keep them healthy financially um, I understand uh, the sheriff's concerns of uh, I, I too don't want our beautiful square to smell or to be destroyed uh, beer will kill grass you know it's uh, even though it has yeast in it it's, it still has alcohol and sugar and other things that will kill the grass so you know I think that's something that uh, could easily be um, monitored and, and, and science will show you whether or not you know that really occurs you know in this situation because it will kill the grass um, there's um, again the the we have been asked to bring this forward and our office has been asked to bring this forward from our downtown merchants um, from uh, citizens uh, and and that's what we're doing tonight you know this is something that uh, that you know we respect the uh, the decision of this board, if they uh, decide not to allow uh, adult beverages in that portion of the square, uh, we will uh, educate our community uh, the best we can uh, to where the areas, the approved areas are. Uh, concerts that uh, we're, or we have a concert scheduled for Friday. Uh, Cinco de Mayo, the stage will not face the uh, the interior of the square will instead face out outward into the sidewalks and the street and the, and the street will also be closed let me emphasize that I mean for a safe environment um, um, again you know our office has done everything uh, that we know to do to present a a, a project <coughs> that um, that we thought everything through again this is a very unique situation even though you know we're surrounded by communities that are doing this and their community is thriving we have a uh, unique situation in that the uh, the square uh, the the gr uh, green space um, is is not you know owned by the city so this is something that you know there has to be uh, a partnership if this is going to work in that area so uh, again we respect the decision of uh, whatever the decision is tonight uh, by you know, the commissioners and the, uh, um, if there's any questions again I think I went over everything uh, at the last meeting that I had but if there's any follow-up questions I'd be glad to uh, to take those right now thank you sir Commissioner what's your pleasure uh, Commissioner um, Henderson thank you. <clears throat> thank you thank you mr. chairman and, and thank uh, thank you Ken um, question that I have in the people who live on on Lee Street in the, uh, I can't think of the little street, the old, by the little firehouse house back over that way, and by uh, the church. Ivy Street? Yes, yes, back on that way. Would that be included in the uh, part of, of, of the drinking district or area? Or would just, it would just be the sidewalks? No, sir, it's a very uh, restricted area. Uh, you know, I had, a, I had a map up here uh, last time and it showed it's basically connecting the nine uh, establishments that are licensed to uh, to sell alcohol. It, it's it's a pathway that would connect businesses, not just uh, not just restaurants, but also, you know, our, our downtown merchants. Correct. But it does it does not go that far, no okay. sir. So so if some of my constituents would say I'm going to come to the square, I'm gonna get me a beer, and I walk back down to the Lee Street and back over that way. And they, if they were stopped by an officer, couldn't they be uh, arrested for public drunk? Public drunk if they're intoxicated. Yes. Uh, you know, a, a violation of the consumption uh, ordinance. Uh, there's going to be trash cans placed on the exit points of when you are leaving that that area. Um, We've uh, met with the police department. There's going to be um, officer discretion in that situation. There's going to be an educational period of time where you know you want to make sure everybody understands what the rules are when you go into an establishment where you can purchase and understand that this is not something that uh, you cannot bring adult beverages into the square these are only being purchased yes. from Absolutely. restaurants uh, each one of the restaurants uh, has agreed to participate in a program called tips which is a basic uh, training this organized training to, to focus on over-serving issues, how to de-escalate a situation uh, where someone becomes angry because they're, you know, they're not being 
being served. So again, another safeguard, you know, being put in place to help that. But the police department is very clear on where the uh, areas are. Uh, uh, we, our office is going to do our very best to educate the public. The restaurants themselves will have uh, cards that they will have in their possession that uh, they will hand people to show them a map, showing them where they are and how far they can go you know, with that. And before they exit that area, they will, they will travel past a red, a bright red trash can to show where they would need to dispose, you know, of, you know, of the uh, cup. Uh, and, and I'm pretty sure it's been, count, it's been weird thought, thought out. Um, I also have, and if, if I may, I guess this is more in district four, I can make, make a motion. Uh, or is, is it more discussion? Okay. Yes, yes we do. Um, you know, I frequently go to the local churches in town, especially like Bethlehem, uh, New Hope, and, and West Street, and all the churches in you know, that particular area. And basically, from what I'm hearing from the uh, faith-based <coughs> church is that they do not want us to participate in, in drinking. However, uh, what I've suggested to them was that let the city of Covington have a 90-day uh, trial period, come back with the data, and then maybe possibly if, if this board want to consider it, then maybe they would um, uh, look at maybe another motion to approve it, maybe on down the line. But I think right now, when I talk to uh, my, my constituents in the area, faith-based, organization and they're saying it's not at this time and so having said that i'm going with the uh, recommendation of the sheriff is to deny access to the square is there a second 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 it's been motioned by commissioner henderson um and second by commissioner mason any more discussion uh commissioner edwards and then commissioner mason thank you mr chairman so um, I'm going to go against what the young lady had to say earlier and use my emotion um, in, in supporting this resolution. And let me tell you why. Two, two, three years ago, this came before this board with no plan. Um, no plan whatsoever, and I voted no. I, although I knew the positive economic development that I was saying no to. So I'm not saying. I'm in favor of this resolution for the economic development. I say I'm, in, I'm in favor of this resolution for the safety of the square, and I will argue that any event on the green part of this square, if it were to be held tonight, you could go across the street and find a number of coolers full of alcoholic beverages today. Um, with what Mr. Malcolm has proposed, those coolers would not be allowed you would have to go back to the establishments, the, the stated establishments, to purchase that, uh, uh, the next, your next alcoholic beverage, um, making it more difficult to overindulge, in my opinion. So I'm in favor of the resolution on the, on the, based on the premise that it would make our, our square safer during these, these events. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Mason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Malcolm, for your presentation uh, and all the work that you've done uh, on this particular subject matter. Uh, thank you, Sheriff Brown, as well, for your uh, input uh, in regards to this matter. It is definitely a very unique situation, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, we do have a small square uh, in its proximity. And so we do have a variety of individuals that visit our square on a regular basis. Uh, we do have uh, youth, we have seniors, we have families, we have a variety. Uh, and so I, I think it will be a great thing to kind of see uh, how it works on the sidewalks uh, and keeping uh, the square as a safe zone, as a safe area uh, for those uh, families that may be 
uh, on, this, uh, on the inner part of the square at the same time that you have individuals on the sidewalks. Uh, so I would definitely like to see uh, how this 90 day period works with it being on the sidewalks uh, and then maybe uh, if we can get some good data back, get some good feedback from that, uh, maybe revisit um, this conversation or a discussion in regards to that safe zone, that green space. Uh, we are always trying to do our best uh, to protect uh, green spaces as much as we possibly can. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of economic development. Uh, everybody knows that. Uh, so uh, I'm not saying that I don't want the, uh, it to hinder the economic development. And I think still having it on the sidewalks uh, still allows that opportunity for there to be a balance. Uh, I don't think we should have all or nothing. Uh, I, I think it's great to have that balance, to just to kind of see what happens around the perimeter of the square and then even on the outer skirts uh, and if that could potentially impact uh, the green space. Now, uh, Commissioner Edwards talks about what's going on there now. I think that should be something that should be addressed. Uh, if we currently have uh, coolers on the green space and they're not supposed to be, uh, then I think it is up to those that uh, enforce in that area to begin to now, uh, now that we have this, put that additional enforcement in place so that when you see individuals that are on that green space and they shouldn't have coolers and they shouldn't be there, direct them back to where they can. Uh, and so that could potentially be an area of opportunity where uh, our law enforcement can say, hey, this is a safe area. This is a safe zone if you don't mind redirecting those back to the area where it is permissible. So I, I think having that balance uh, is great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Um, anyone else? All in favor? Aye. Commissioner, his, his motion was to, 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 to deny. Yep. Commissioner Henderson made a motion to deny. All in favor? Commissioner Sanders? Aye. Any opposed? It passed 3 1. I mean, 4 1. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Hamm. Chairman, the next item on the agenda is item number 8, the consent agenda for approval. Got to seek a motion that we approve the six, uh, consent agenda, please. Second. Motion by Commissioner Edwards, second by Commissioner Mason. Any discussion? All in favor? Commissioner Sanders? Aye. Thank you. It passed 5 0. Ms. Chairman, Hamm. the next item on the agenda is item number 9 probate court purchasing. Request approval for purchasing card or P card for probate court. Judge Melanie Bell to be used for annual subscription fees that can only be paid by P card. And of course, Judge Bell is here to present. Good evening. Good evening, Chairman and Commissioners. Um, this should be brief. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, last fall I learned that to attend the Constitutional Officers Association training in the fall, that we could no longer do that by filling out a form and submitting a check from the county. They had gone to all paying um, online. I contacted um, Ms. Brittany White to see what I could do um, to address that. She said that is becoming more common. Um, and I already used the finance card to cover a couple of other things that I'll talk about in a second. And she recommended the cleanest way was just to pay for it myself and get reimbursed. Um, I have been probate judge for six full years. I'm in my seventh year never had a purchase card because frankly I don't want the issues that can come with it. Um, but we have also learned another issue came up recently. Um, I pay for, a, and this is all out of my county budget already, I pay for a Zoom account um, because the probate rules were recently um, updated to allow us to continue virtual hearings in particular matters, status conferences, things of that nature that'll make our calendars move more quickly. Um, and of course, during the pandemic, probate and magistrate um, utilized Zoom quite a bit. Um, that is currently paid for once a year on Brittany White's finance uh, purchase card. 
Um, we also have a scheduling program that allows people to make their appointments for marriage licenses and for weapons carry license appointments online um, at any time of day instead of just from 8 to 5 when the office is open. Um, it became an issue when I went to, I logged into Zoom to conduct a hearing and got this alert saying, you need to update your card with us. I called finance to get the information and I was told, here's the new card information. However, when is this gonna go through? Because if it goes through this month, there's only $50 left on the card. So I might lose my Zoom account, which is very important. Um, we're currently between the two courts having court five days a week. And so often with both courts functioning, and so losing my access to Zoom because we don't have enough on a P card that I'm sharing with other people through the finance department um, just seems silly. Um, I spoke to Brittany White and to Randy um, Fincher. They explained the process to me that if I ordered, asked for one to be done in the name of one of my employees, my chief clerk, for example, that there was no need to come before the board. Um, but if I wanted one in my name, I had to come before the board. Obviously, I think if I'm the head of the department and I'm the elected official, it should be in my name. I'm the one who's ultimately um, gonna be answering to the people. Um, and so I'm just here to request that we be given a P card. It has a, the typical $1,000 a month. $600 is the max purchase amount because my scheduling um, software costs $588 a year. Um, so we had to go to 600 to be able to make that transaction. And of course, per the rules, you can't split up transactions. Um, so that is the request. Everything is already part of my budget. Um, and I think y'all have seen from my actions in the last six years that I watch my uh, budget very carefully um, and probably drive Brittany White and her staff nuts making sure that every dollar is accounted for. So I'm just asking that. A P card be issued issued for those limited times for things that have to be paid online and uh, cannot be paid through an invoice to the finance department. Thank you, ma'am. I seek a motion, please. So moved. Can I get been motion by Commissioner Mason and second by Commissioner Cowan. Any discussion? All in favor? I have, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. I'm I'm just in agreement with. Uh, Judge Bell, I do think that our P card process needs to be revamped if we get a, the moment to look over it. Because I even requested one just for trial when I want to give it back. I didn't want it. Just like Judge Bell, Bell said, I don't, I don't want it in my hands. Um, I think we need to sit back and look at our P card process and eventually revamp it because it's old and outdated. Thank you, ma'am. Any more discussion? All in favor? Commissioner Sanders. Aye. Thank you. It passes 5-0. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman, the next item on the agenda is Mr. Jason Johnson, the facilities director, requesting approval of change order number two for Five Fields Lawn Care for three additional locations, which shall include 42 visits per year and Pine Straw. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, sir. How are uh, you doing, board? Uh, I am here to present a change order for our landscape maintenance services. Um, you just heard those locations. I'll go over them again. That's fire station number five, uh, the east side roundabout, and then the mental and physical health drive. Uh, that yearly total for all of those sites are $9,996. And if you uh, agree to add those sites tonight, that brings our total uh, for our landscape maintenance services to $128,497.56. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have about those numbers are uh, the services they provide. Thank you, sir. Uh, commissioners, I seek a motion, please. Can I get a second? It's been motioned by, um, I think, Commissioner Henderson, and second by Commissioner Cowan. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Commissioner Sanders? Aye. Thank you. It passes 5 0. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Chairman, the next item we have is item number 11 with the assistance of Mr. Brian Fazio. We have uh, the ARPA update with Ms. Kennedy Shannon with iParametrics. Good evening, Ms. Kennedy. Hello, how are you? Great, how are you doing? Thank you for being with us tonight. 
No problem. Thanks for having me. So I wanted to come um, before the board because I needed a few things to pass by you guys and get some information from you. So first and foremost, I wanted to talk about the youth and food, and food pantry nonprofit program. Right now, we really don't have any structure on how the funds are supposed to be used. The only parameters we had in place was that the food pantry had to be pre-existing, the youth program had to be pre-existing, um, and that they had to meet the qualifications of a nonprofit. And so what we're seeing is applicants are asking for the full amount, right? They can get up to 50,000 for youth and up to uh, 30,000 for food pantry. But I'm recommending that we put some parameters on this because some of the asks that we're getting um, are say, for example, there was one particular applicant that wanted to use the money for construction to increase the size of the church's sanctuary to have youth programming. And I just thought that was kind of a stretch. Um, so I'm recommending that for youth programming food pantry, that we limit it to direct assistance to the youth and direct assistance to the food pantry meaning that the money has to go directly to the youth in the form of programming, staffing, um, costs like that, and not necessarily, you know, construction costs and those items that don't necessarily have a direct line impact to the youth. Um, I think if we put that restriction on this, we'll have more programs that are actually tailored to the youth and what we want to do, as opposed to having some of these projects that are like construction based and may have an impact on the youth later down the road, but don't have that direct line impact to the youth or the food pantry. So that's my recommendation to you all. Um, I wanted to come before you all and ask that we make that the requirement. We have currently um, 39 applications for nonprofit assistance. So um, I'm, you all have been outreaching, we've been outreaching, we've been cold calling and sending emails. So we definitely have seen an intake in nonprofit applications. Um, and so we're in the process. We've not awarded any funding, excuse me, any funding yet because we wanted to bring this to you all to get the clarity and the um, authorization to limit the youth and food pantry to that direct assistance. But so far, so good. We have a decent number of applicants in the system. Thank you. Um, any questions, commissioners? Commissioner Henderson? How much money have we uh, have we alloc allocated for that? So total for nonprofits so and nonprofit assistance is in three categories. We have general nonprofit assistance, we have youth uh, nonprofit for the youth programs, and then we have food pantry. So all of those are in one application, and we're giving away a total of three point two million, I think, total for that for those three programs. Any more, questions? Any more questions? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Um, Attorney Kennedy, with those 39 applicants, do you anticipate, and this might be a hard question, or you probably answer, that there will be funding left over based on what you've seen of how many people have actually requested funding? I think so. I think if we put these parameters on youth and a food pantry, so the nonprofit, general nonprofit assistance grant is tied to the reduction of income that the nonprofit can show. So that's pretty black and white. You show us two income statements, one pre-COVID, one after COVID. And say, for instance, if you have a $20,000 reduction, you get a $20,000 grant. So that's pretty black and white. It's the youth in the food pantry that's pretty gray. And so by us putting, again, those parameters to say, the assistance has to be direct assistance to the youth, we can then, you know, I think some of those asks that we've got in these applications will be dwindled down to just that assistance that's going directly to the youth. Thank you. Any more questions, guys? We need a motion for that. We do We do need a motion for that. Um, I seek a motion, please. So moved. Can I get a second? Second. It's been motioned by Commissioner Mason and second by Commissioner Edwards. Any more discussion? Commissioner Henderson? I have a question in, in, in online. Mm -hmm. Of uh, about the um, uh, senior assistance, because I've been getting a lot of calls uh, for help. So where might we be on that that particular program? So senior home repair and sewer to septic conversion grants should be launched June first. Okay, 
We're in the process of building that out. June 1st, and I think at present, is it $15,000 or have we got it up to, I think? It was That's currently what the last discussion was. So we have, for senior home repair, the max would be 15,000 per applicant. And for sewer to septic, um, it would be between 15 and 20,000. Of course, we need to under, get an understanding of what that actual cost looks like to convert sewer to septic. And of course, every project's gonna be different, but um, we're thinking the same thing around 15,000 for sewer to septic, and then 15,000 for low-income senior home repair. Okay. Well, I, I, was, I was hoping that the board you may look at it when that time comes to uh, moving up to at least $40,000 for senior assistance, and I, you know, and I, I was hoping the board would uh, look at it and hopefully approve it. Mr. Chairman, I have a, a question. Once you, I don't know if Mr. Henderson is, Commissioner Henderson is complete. Go, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I would like to, well, let me ask this question first. I know you stated that the small business and nonprofit, I'm not small business, but the seniors is moving, because I know we eventually said, we said it was gonna be in May and small business and nonprofit was gonna be June. So is the small business and nonprofit now going to be pushed back to August? Small business and nonprofit will probably be July. So as we're wrapping up ERAP, we've got nonprofit assistance going out. ERAP, the last day for emergency rental assistance was April 30th. So we're processing the existing applications in the system. That program shuts down. Then we've got low income, senior home repair, sewer to septic, and we'll have nonprofits still running. And then we do small business assistance. Okay, so I would like to um, add on to that motion that whatever funding is left over from the nonprofit to be placed in the senior home repair. If that can, if the commission doesn't mind amending their motion, if there's money left over from the nonprofit assistance to have that moved into the senior home repair so we can have additional funding to possibly offer seniors more of a repair. And also just to keep in mind, you all still have some money left to be obligated. So if you need to go into that, you have funding available for that. You have a little over $4 million left to re obligate. So if there's funding left over, I was trying to help you out. So you want to come back before the board to give you kind of approval to have it go into another program. So you don't have to come back before us. I got so you. I, no, I'm just, I mean, from the, from the reaction we've got from these nonprofits, I doubt there'll be anything left. Okay. okay. But in the event that there is, we will roll it in. But I'm saying if there isn't and you still want to put more money into that program, you do have the account on the side. Okay. But if, once we shut it down, if there's anything left, we'll definitely roll it into senior home repair. Okay. I apologize. That's, that's what I misunderstood. That's, that's the question I asked earlier. Did you kind of think there would be some funding left over? Because you only had 39 applicants and we had 3.2 million total. So that's all. Okay. Well, the application period is still is to the um, my understanding we did it to May 30th, so there's still. Oh, I thought it left. ended the 28th of April. I thought we were going to. Well, my, my I'm sorry, that's on my list. My recommendation is to extend it because oh. early on we didn't get that many applications, okay. and it was getting the word out. And so for the first two weeks, there were only like just those eight applications. So these 30 applications we've got have come literally within like the last two weeks. So the word is out now. So I was thinking we should extend kind of similar to what we did with the Youth Commission by extending that deadline to allow more nonprofits to apply. Now, if you don't want to do that, then we can just process the applications we have in the system and not extend that uh, deadline. But if we do extend the deadline, I anticipate that 3.2 being spent up by nonprofits, so. My, my concern is extending it because our small businesses have been waiting for a long time and it's going to put, keep, keep pushing them back and pushing them back. So if we extend it, I think we've had enough time to have the small, I mean, nonprofits to submit now, whatever my colleagues may want to chime in on that, but I think we've given them enough time to submit. So if we can kind of shut that portion down and then kind of quickly get to the small businesses, that would be great. Cause they are, they've been asking, they've been waiting. Um, Kennedy, um, let me jump in for a quick second. Um, uh -huh. So if if we are extending, that means we're going to push the seniors back also, um, right? No, so if we extend it for 30 days, we still have a plan to launch seniors June 1st. But let me ask you this also, there was an opportunity for us to do a second round for the money that's not yeah. given out, right? Absolutely. There's always an opportunity later in the year to do a second round. So if you wanted to stop it based on this deadline and 
process what we have now and then look later down the road to do a second um, nonprofit, you could absolutely do that. Yeah, because I, I, I agree. I think we got to get at least at some point when we get into seniors and the small businesses um, an opportunity to um, apply. Um, and if we did that, I think we should be able to, to do that because then ERAP will be um, winding down, so we won't have that. And then nonprofit, for the most part, is really simple to go through and review those applications. You either meet the definition or you don't. And again, now that we have clarification that it needs to be direct assistance to you, we can go through there and start allocating. So once those are done, then I can do, I just don't want to run more than two programs at a time only staffing requirements for that too, but also having so many programs out at one given time and all of them having a similar due date. Um, you know, it just seems a lot for the community. So if we have two running at the same time, we can have senior and low income home repair running and small business running. So small business and senior um, home repair are gonna be our two most popular ones. Those are the ones we get calls about. But when we prioritized it, we prioritized ERAP because these are people who are being evicted and then the nonprofits were, you know, more of a priority at the time than we had for small business. But we're going to get to the small business community, and we're definitely getting to our low-income seniors. So, okay. Commissioner Henderson, you got a question? Okay. You know, we had talked a little bit about uh, at the, at the uh, different sites uh, as far as for our the applicants, and especially yes. coming online about the seniors. So, where are we at with that? Because I'm, you know. Because even though we would like to think that all of our young people who may may need assistance may know how to get that assistance or apply for that assistance, they can't. And the seniors too as well, you know, um, some of the ones who was applying for uh, their utilities and, and their mortgage and they could not even, you know, know how to navigate to get online in order to apply for that particular, for that money. And so um, I know at one point we were gonna have somebody I thought uh, over at the courthouse uh, and other places. So where we is where is it now? So we had a conversation with Laura Bertram. We did the job description. My understanding is she posted it and she's been interviewing for those three positions. So there's going to be three locations and one part-time person at each of the three locations. So that's moving. So hopefully I'll get an update from Laura. The plan was to have those people in place before the, the senior home repair program is released because we know the seniors are going to be the ones who need that assistance the most. Absolutely. So we're working on that. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Mason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, uh, Attorney Shannon, for this presentation mm -hmm. thus far. Uh, in regards to the discussion that we just had in regards to possibly kind of wrapping up the uh, nonprofit and mm -hmm. so that we can kind of get to our seniors and the small businesses uh, sooner than uh, the timeline that we originally had. So what would be your recommendation of when it would be best to kind of close out that uh, nonprofit program? And then what would be the new timeline to get the, uh, get the program with the seniors started and the small businesses uh, and then, of course, later on, if we have to come back to nonprofits, we can. So just I know it's been just a very quick discussion, but <laughs> I gotcha. yeah, would can you see a timeline with what we're kind of asking? Absolutely. So if we're shutting nonprofit down based on the applications we have here. I can anticipate that my staff can get through those applications and make a decision within the next 30 days. If so, nonprofit will be done and that's off our plate. We then move to senior low, him, low income senior home repair. There should be no reason as to why I can't also launch small business assistance a couple of weeks after senior home repair. If we have nonprofit done and ERAP wrapping up, then my staff can focus on those two full-time programs. So it'll pretty much speed up small business assistance by about two weeks. So, so we'll have low income senior home repair June 1st small business assistance june 15th that was my question about mid part of june versus yes. the beginning of july okay. yes that was that answered my question thank you mr yes. chair thank you any more uh, commissioner Cowan. thank you mr chairman um what's the amount on the uh home repair did you mention that a while ago 
I did. So right now for low income senior home repair, we have a million dollars allocated and with the max being 15,000 per applicant. Okay. Um, I'm just not sure that's going to be enough money to, to handle anything. Um, do you need a, I mean, do you need a motion from the board to change that or what do you need? You would need a motion from the board to increase that amount. Like I said, for my calculations, you have about 4.5 left in unallocated funding. So if you wanted to double that, you could add another million to low income home repair and you'll have 3.5 left to allocate. Okay. I'm just, I'm just trying to think of based on cost of, uh, what it would cost to fix some things. Um, okay. I just had that question. Mr. Chairman, I have one more question for attorney uh, Kennedy. Shannon, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, in regards to the home repair, I had seniors reach out to me and said that they're going to be required to have two estimates. Is that correct? That is so, correct. A lot of the seniors, when you say low income, some of these estimates may cost them about a hundred, depending on the consultant. So I don't know if we as a county need to put together a list of people that would do estimates for a certain amount. I don't know if we can get involved legally with that. I have to seek with counsel, but that's going to be an issue with a lot of our seniors who don't have the income to get these estimates. So they don't know which ones are legitimate that they should be paying a certain price or somebody who will come out and give them a free consultation. So that's going to be an issue because I did have many of them reach out to me and I need to call some more back. I got so many calls, I but um, that's been an issue. Well, what we've seen in other communities is that once the most of the contractors in the area kind of learn about this program, they will then come out and do no cost estimates because they obviously want to get the work right. So that's what we've seen is that, the, you know, the construction community is pretty small in every town. And once the contractors hear that this is a program that's running, and it's for low income seniors, they tend to waive any type of fee to come out and do an estimate, especially with the auspice of them might being able to get the work, so. And my last question is to our county attorney. Is there any legalities of the county putting together a list of all the contractors in the county so that they can have a list of contractors based on their expertise and professionalism to provide to the residents? I would have, I, hello. Um, I would advise against it just because we don't want to show favoritism. Um, and then with, I think you mentioned with the county paying out um, or paying for these estimates, I would advise against that as well, just because we don't want to violate the gratuities clause in any way. Oh, no, I didn't suggest the paying for the estimates. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was just stating for um, that it's going to cost them. And so I was just um, trying to help to where if we have a list of a, uh, uh, contractors, not just saying certain contractors, all the contracts that are in, in Newton County, if there's a list that they, we could provide to the residents, maybe on the website to say, these are the contractors we have in Newton County, you select from that list based on they could do it themselves. So, I mean, if you wanted to do a list, I would recommend maybe do, if, you know, these contractors are registered with the county as contractors and you have all the contractors that are registered with the county, that might be a list that then doesn't necessarily, you know, because these are all of our registered construction companies with the county. This is an option for you. Um, so as long as that list is coming from some type of, um, you know, generic database where all the contractors who are licensed for in the county, for instance, would appear in this particular database, I wouldn't see any issue with providing that as a list. But to create a list and kind of pick construction companies, I think you run into the favoritism issue that the previous city attorney just talked about. So, thank you, uh, Commissioner Henderson. A brief, uh, brief note. I think if, if there's any contractor who lives in Newton County and is a certified contractor, then he or she should be on a list that would be generated. Because I just want uh, just for it to be a list of just people who may do work with the county but it be a list of anybody who is a licensed contractor. So that if you want to go that route, that's something that I could potentially work with with the new county manager to put together that list um, so that then we have that to put out. We've got until June 1st to get something like that in place. So a little, you know, a day shy of a month. But um, if you wanted to go in that direction, 
I could work with the county manager's office to make sure that we get a list like that in place. All right. Thank you. Um, any more discussion? All in favor? I, can may I ask what we're, I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat the motion so I know it includes everything that Attorney Shannon is requesting? I'm not sure if it includes everything she requested. Yeah, it's on the it's on the motion. It's the first motion. Um, Attorney Shannon, I think the, you want to complete. Uh, yeah, I think the, the motion was to approve direct assistance for youth grant programming. Yep. Food food pantry program. The sounds like maybe the creation of a list of registered licensed contractors in Newton County to provide to our seniors. Um, that's kind of my understanding thus far. And we did decide to keep the date. We're not extending, correct? Correct. Not extending. And not extending the nonprofit date. Absolutely. Let's do this. Let's let's um, amend that motion. Uh, Commission, will you amend your motion to um, what um, Attorney Shannon said? Oh, yeah, yeah motion. you made the motion. Will you? Yes. Okay. I'll amend my motion to uh, Attorney. Okay, and I think Commissioner Edwards. Okay, any more discussion? All in favor? Commissioner Sanders? Aye. Thank you, it passes by a vote. Okay, I got one couple more updates. So, Youth Commission has 39 applicants now, so you all will be receiving emails uh, from me with all the applications for the youth that applied in your district. The deadline for that we had extended to April 30th as well. So we definitely got more applicants that applied. So I'm super happy about that. So again, you will receive the application data for each of the youth who applied from your district so that you can review and then make your selections. Those emails, you should get those emails before Friday. Um, so those will go out for that. And then the last but not least, I know I brought this up during the last meeting was the iParametrics task order. So we're going to have to review our task orders. So when we first applied for the RFP, there was no mention of us actually running the programs, providing project management services for the programs. It was just consulting services. And then when we came on board, we had the issue with Salvation Army, and then we were asked to actually run these programs. So as it stands now, iParametrics will help disseminate via programs $8.4 million. Um, the de minimis rate for administrative costs for the federal government is 10%. That's standard across the board for all administrative costs for federal programs is 10%. That being said, we're asking to increase our task order so that we can get the 10% on the 8.4 million that we're distributing. Um, the admin cost that was given to Salvation Army was 15% on their emergency rental assistance program, which is actually over the de minimis rate but the de minimis rate right now for the federal government is 10% of the administrative costs for the total programs administered. So what that would do is that would increase our task order by $420,000 for a total of $840,000, which is 10% of the $8.4 million that we're disseminating through all of the programs that we're running for you for the life of ARPA. Mr. Chair, may I ask a question? Uh, sure. Uh -huh. um, so that's four hundred twenty thousand dollars on, a, and the first amount was I know it was quite half a million. It was four twenty. Was 420. So additional four twenty. So a total of almost uh, almost a million, eight hundred thousand dollars, eight hundred forty thousand dollars, okay. which is ten percent of the eight point four million that we're giving. So that includes. Youth Engagement Nonprofit Grant, Rental Assistance Program, Utility Assistance Program, Low Income Senior Home Repair, Septic and Sewer um, Home Program, Nonprofit, General Nonprofit Assistance Grant, Food Pantry Grant, and Small Business Assistance. That's us running every single one of those programs. And do we anticipate anything additional outside of this $840,000? No, so, no, so that, that's the max we can charge per the federal government, that's the de minimis rate. And that would be a do not exceed rate. So that's not 
you know, that's what we cannot exceed for the life of the contract. But knowing all of these programs that we still have yet to run, we're going to need that because we're going to, we're giving away another almost $6 million between now and the end of ARPA with low-income senior home repairs, small business assistance, and now nonprofit assistance. Um, I, I got to jump in right quick. Um, Attorney mm -hmm. Shannon, do this include um, any kind of second round that may occur? Because I know there's going to be funds so, for a second round. Would that include that as yes. well? This would include that. So assuming right now, this is what you've allocated. You've allocated this $8.4 million. So our administrative cost is based on the amount of the allocation, right? So if you gave, it's just like with any other thing. If you gave United Way a million dollars, they would be entitled to $100,000 of administrative costs to administer that million dollar program. So right now you're at 8.4. If you allocate any additional funding, I don't see a reason why we would need to update up that. I think we should be able to get what's done with the 840,000, but that takes us to 2026, which is the end of our budget. Mr. Chairman, may I ask a question? Sure. Uh -huh. So that goes to you basically saying we shouldn't touch the remaining of our ARPA dollars because we don't know what we have. No, no, so no, no. Our... no, you have $4.5 million left. So okay. I'm asking for 420 an additional to our task order. That leaves the rest of your money to do whatever you want to do with it. If you create a new program, say, for instance, you say we want to do a homeless assistance program and you want us to run it, it'll just be 10% or whatever that program is for administrative costs. So I'm confused on our remainder because I know when uh, Piedmont came before us, we were told we had 2.2 .2 million left and they want the remainder of our ARPA funds. So I'm confused on how much we really have left. So the report I got from Brittany, the most recent, unless you allocated a couple million that, I'm, that her and Brittany or myself is not um, aware of, you have about 4.5 million bucks. You've allocated 5.2 million. 5 million went to general infrastructure projects. 200,000, I think, went to the youth vehicles that we were yeah. buying. Yep. And we I've got, um, yep, 420,000 was our original purchase order. 1.9 million was the one-time premium pay that you did for COVID. Uh, we've got a million dollars allocated for low-income senior home repair. We've got 700,000 allocated for septic to sewer. We've got a million dollars for broadband. We've got 600,000 for the food security grant program. We've got um, $2 million for, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, COVID-19 small business assistance, a million dollars for small business assistance. Um, $2 million for COVID nonprofit assistance. 600,000 for utility assistance. Um, 900000 for renter and mortgage assistance, 500000 for youth engagement, 9327 for Liberty Middle School youth engagement, 50000 for youth commission, and then we've already given 672 to willing helpers, 400 to viewpoint help. Um, we still have um, that $50,000 that we had allocated for the vaccination program that we canceled. That's still sitting there. We need to reallocate that including the 10,000 for marketing and promotion. And we also still have the 150,000 we put for the law enforcement mental health program that we've not been able to kind of get off the ground yet. So that, actually, those are all of the allocations that I've got, I'm sorry. And actually the uh, mental health, and I'll bring that to um, the board, uh, our chairman, uh, is gonna be coming before the board in regards to that, but they have to come before the board. But I think one thing that you missed is that we voted last meeting for broadband for a area in district three, they have to bring the invoice to us to allocate those funds. So that's gonna be a portion of that as well. I don't know how much that costs. Okay, okay. So yeah, from what I got from Brittany, you're at like 4.5 left, so. Okay. Now I do know that you gave the warming center money and I know that that came out of ARPA and I know that that's not on here, but I think it was like 30,000 or something dollars and then she came back, so I don't see, that's the only thing I don't see reflected on here, um, is the money that was ultimately taken out of ARPA for the warming center. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Henderson. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. C. A uh, question, I, I know we kind of did an, another, what, additional 40,000? 40, uh, 400,000. 
I would like, if we and we possibly could have legal to kind of look at that, because it's like we're doing another contract. They would feel like to me, and and to make sure that um, not that I don't trust you, but I've always wanted to think that the reason why we have, and we talked earlier about <laughs> about you and saying you said, well, I don't know, you said I'm not Patrick. I know you look better than Patrick, but what I mean <laughs> is that so you can go over there and look at it and then give us hopefully some kind of a report. I mean, it's a mess in the board. Um, Commissioner Edwards and being Commissioner Cowell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, from the last few minutes discussion, I've, I believe we need uh, Miss Miss Kennedy and, and Brittany to get together and reconcile our record yeah. to make sure, and then report back to us to make sure we all on the same page as to what we have left over. And uh, Tim, and my second point is 10% uh, from Miss Miss Kennedy uh, and the godsend she's been is a bargain. So, uh, if we need a motion on that, I'll make it now. So, you go. You making a motion to? Do we need a, if we need a motion on to approve the ten percent Miss Kennedy's asking for now? I'll make that motion. I know. Are you making it in a motion? I, that's a motion. Okay. Is there a second? Is there a second? Second. The motion by Commissioner um, Edwards and second by Commissioner Mason. Um, discussion, Commissioner Cowell. Okay, I'd like to have a secondary motion on this and that's to table it because this sounds like a modification of the original contract. Uh, get that drafted up and send it to our county attorney for review before we vote on this. So just for clarity, it's actually not a modification because the original RFP that we replied to did not include any of this. It did not include us running your ERAP program. It did not include us running any program for you. No, we but, these are, got into this, but these are I'm additional sorry. terms. These are additional terms. No, no, absolutely. We got into this due to the situation with Salvation Army, right? None of us knew that that happened. We got in it, we found out Salvation Army had issues, and then we were asked to run that program, but that was not in our original contract scope. So you're right, we're gonna have to redo our contract to include all these additional programs right. that we're running. I wanna see a redone contract sent to the county attorney for their review yeah. before we vote on this. That's that's my motion. That's my substitute motion. Is there a second? Uh, second. Um, it's been motioned by um, Commissioner Cowan and second by Commissioner um, Henderson that we table this. Is that correct? Yes. That we table this until we um, get a contract um, with yeah with the new conditions from our county attorney get it approved. So, is there any discussion, Commissioner Henderson? This this is uh, to me is very important. And the question that I asked, would I spend the taxpayers' money any kind of way? And I think there's got to be some kind of safeguard, at least to the public, that we're just not saying, going to raise our hand up and give away money without having somebody who has more expertise than, than I know myself look at. So, I'm sorry, if I may, I just want to clarify, I'm not asking you to just give me money. We're earning this money and that we're literally administering every single program for Newton County and we're giving away $8.4 million. If you had to do this internally, you would have to have a full-time staff that can administer all of these programs and review all of these applications. And again, the federally minimal rate is 10%. This isn't something that I care is making up. This is from the federal government. Yes, I'm not saying that you're wrong. The only thing I'm saying is that in order to make a decision on giving away taxpayers money, that we, no, I, that I know I'm in control of to a certain degree with, with the vote, then I would like to have the expertise of our county attorney, who we pay to as well, to give us um, more information. And no, I believe it's good. I think it's going to go, but I just can't raise my hand up and say I'm going to get somebody 10 No, I'm in, in agreement. If you want to draft contract, I'm in agreement. If you want to draft contract to review and you want me to get with Brittany and us to come back before you all with a concrete amount of what yes, you have left and that contract, I have no objection to that. Yes, Thank you. I got um, Commissioner Edwards and then you Commissioner Sanders. Uh, I, I'm going to agree. I'm going to go with the table, but we, we the, the contract was null and void essentially when when 
when the, the Salvation Army went out the window and, uh, you know, Miss Kennedy took over the program. Um, so I, I'm not so sure I w she's, I'm not so sure I would have moved forward um, without our contract at that time. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Sanders. Yes, sir. Uh, Ms. Kennedy, actually, uh, Attorney Shannon actually made a point um, in regards to full-time staff. I don't know if you all uh, recall when we, before we actually moved to this direction, I was saying the amount of money that I knew we were going to spend, we could have created a staff in the county in the amount of money that we're spending and could have paid them for a certain amount of years with the amount of money we're spending. She's doing an excellent job. I'm not going against what she's doing, but I'm saying the amount of money that we just are spending, we could have had employees paid. I will uh, say to, the, to that, one of, one of the things our clients, and we, we express this with our clients, right? <laughs> Nobody wants to hire a team and then lay them off when the money's gone, right? Because ARPA is only for a certain amount. You would have to hire a team and then lay them off. When you hire a consultant, you don't have that situation, right? Because you don't have to lay anybody off. We have a contract. Once the work is done, it's done. But that's one of the, the cons of hiring an internal team. Not only that, but you have to get the level of expertise to that team where it needs to be in order to manage eight, you know, $20 million of federal funding. That's not an easy feat in and of itself. And even if you created a department, the, that subject matter expertise that you would need to have is really hard to get in a, in a department created like that quickly and then having to then disperse that department and lay everybody off when the ARPA funding is gone, so. What well, would have helped though, because we're lacking in a procurement department that would have assisted with us creating a procurement department because we don't have one. And that was supposed to happen with our interim county manager system would create that department. So those funds would have helped get it started because we're out of compliance, not even having a procurement department here in Newton County. But that would have helped here, of that 4.5 you have left, you can use some of that to create a procurement department. That is a our allowable ARPA use if you wanted to move in that direction, just FYI. All in favor of which one? Of the substitute motion. Oh, okay. <laughs> Table in. Table, yep. Commissioner Sanders. Aye. Thank you. It passes 5-0. Perfect. So I will get with Brittany and we will draft a a new contract based on the new scope of work, based on all the programs that we're running. We will get that over to you all to take a look at and then um, probably come before you at the next uh, commission meeting for review and approval. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. I think that's all I have. Do you have any additional questions for me? No, ma'am, thank you so much. All right, have a good evening. You as well. Okay, bye-bye. Chairman, we are at item number 12. We have Miss Amanda Shoemaker our Human Resources Director. She's requesting review and approval of the County Manager contract for Mr. Harold B. Cooper. Good evening. I believe everyone has a copy of the contract that was sent in the packet. Um, I'm gonna go over the pertinent parts of the contract. Um, the contract is an employment agreement between the county and Harold B. Cooper to serve as our um, county manager. His term will be for two years starting Monday, May 8th, and ending um, May 7th, 2025. As it relates to his compensation, the compensation terms are, um, is he have, he has an annual base salary of $150,000, as well as be eligible for cost of living increases um, equivalent to those provided to our employees. The um, county will pay the premiums um, of his health insurance that, is, uh, that equates to what um, is currently provided to all other employees. Also, um, the county will agree, agree to pay uh, twice the amount of his salary for his life insurance. In addition, the county will agree to pay for his short-term disability co coverage. Um, as it relates to his personal leave, he will be um, allowed to accrue annual leave at the rate of 160 hours per year and accrue sick leave at the rate of 80 hours per year. And I'll be allowed to carry over a maximum of 320 hours of annual leave and if the employee is um, ever separated from the um, county, he should um, he will be um, compensated for all of his accru accrued annually. 
um, as it relates to an automobile, uh, according to this contract, the uh, county will provide him with a vehicle or um, if he so chooses, provide him with an allowance of $500 per month in lieu of providing him with a vehicle. As it relates to his uh, retirement, the um, county will contribute an amount of 5% of his annual salary towards a retirement account, and the employee may make a contribution of up to 5% of his annual salary to the plan as well. And if that is the case, then the county will match the contribution up to an additional 5% into his uh, 401A account. Also, um, upon, upon start, starting, the employee should be considered 100% vested um, under this contract. As it relates to um, his business experience, uh, expenses, the county agrees to pay for his professional dues and subscriptions to, continued, um, to continue his professional participation, growth, and advancement. Um, for the good of the county. In addition, the county agrees to pay for reasonable travel and um, um, substance expenses for his professional and official travel of meetings and occasions to adequately continue the profession his professional development. Also, the county um, will agree to pay for reasonable travel and substance experiences, expenses um, of the employee for short courses, um, institutes, and seminars that are necessary for the um, employee's professional development. In addition, the county um, agrees to pay to provide the uh, employee with a cell phone and, provide, and pay for that service as well as a laptop and our iPad um, um, for his use in conducting official county business. Um, as it relates to involuntary termination, um, in the event the employee is terminated by uh, the board um, by a supermajority vote at a public meeting and the employee is willing and able to perform his duties under this agreement, then in that event, employer agrees to pay employee his monthly salary, including health, dental, short-term disability, retirement, and life insurance benefits for a period of three months. Um, provided, however, that in the event the employee is terminated because of his conviction of any illegal act involving, involving personal gain to him or moral, interp or moral turpitude, then in that event, employer should have no obligation to pay the um, employee any sums. Um, relating to involuntary resignation, in the event the em employer at any time during the term of this agreement reduces the salary or other financial benefits of employee in a greater percentage than any applicable across the board reduction for all employees of employer or in the event employer refuses following um, written notice to comply with any other provisions pre benefiting employee herein or if the employee resigns following an offer to accept resignation, whether formal or informal, by the employer as representative of the majority of the governing body that the employee resigned, then the employee may declare a termination as the date um, of this suggestion. Um, regarding if the employer uh, chooses to resign, the employee, if the employee chooses to resign, the employee must provide the county with 90 days um, written notice unless the county and the employee agree otherwise. Um, the rest, um, if the employee separates from the county, then the employee must immediately return all of the property um, that is in his possession to the county, as well as the employer, the employee agrees to fully cooperate um, with the employer in any and all investigations, inquiries, or litigations as it relates to the county and um, his or her position. Um, relating to performance appraisal, the Board of Commissioners or a designee may conduct annual performance appraisals as it deems necessary and appropriate to evaluate employees' performance effectively. Also, um, Notwithstanding the annual performance appraisals, additional performance appraisals may be utilized as a management tool as necessary to monitor and or approve, improve the employee's job performance. Um, outside activities um, shall be the employee's sole, 
um, employment with the county should be the employee's sole employment. Um, however, the employee may elect to ex accept limited teaching, consulting, or other business opportunities with the understanding that each arrangement, each arrangement shall not constitute interference with nor are a reduced dedication to his re responsibilities under this agreement. It must be approved in advance by the employer prior to the employee undertaking the same. Bonding, the employer should bear the full cost of any fidelity or other bonds required to the employee under any law or ordinances. Um, employee, also, the employee must acquire a non-recourse bond from a sovereign surety license that is able to do business in Newton County in the amount no less than $50,000, conditioned condition on the truthful performance of the individual's um, responsibilities. And any cost associated with securing the surety bond should be paid by Newton County. And the rest of the contract language is just general pro, uh, provisions, um, such as effective date, integration, binding effect, and uh, uh, severability. Thank you. Any questions, commissioners? Yes, uh, commissioner. I'm sorry, Chairman Bain. I do. Go ahead. Uh -huh. um, and I'll just go. Miss uh, Director Shoemaker kind of went over some things, but I just have some clarity. Uh, the first one is the contract term. Um, and it's, and let me put a disclaimer out there. My sole responsibility is to Newton County because I'm an elected official. It's not to an individual, a person, my organization as a, or being Greek or whomever. This is actually, this is the county. That's my main responsibility. So I actually went over the, these contracts in detail with every county manager that came before us, Mr. Kerr and Mr. Sam. So I'm not showing any favoritism are doing it because of, is my sole responsibility is for Newton County. So number one, in regards to two term contract, two year term contract, that concerns me because of our previous situation. And this is not coming at you, Mr. Chair, but you mentioned to us that our previous interim man, county manager barely rarely showed up from work. And I heard that from our employees as well. And if you look at the reviews of the commissioners, Every com we didn't even converse when we did our reviews. Every commissioner had the same information in their reviews, and I gave the second to the highest score. Everybody else was lower. So that is my concern, having someone who is a county manager having two terms, and we don't know what we will receive in one year. We normally do one year. And if they've been with us for a while, I saw the uh, behavior of the pattern that you will go two years after you got, they've gotten acclimated and you see what they've done. But giving someone two years out the gate when we just came from issues with our previous interim county manager coming to work. And I, as commissioners, we weren't even aware that this occurred for a whole entire year. So that is my complete concern with that. I believe that it should go to a one year term. And then after that one year, we evaluate and it can go back from there. We have to make sure that we're putting the county's best interest at heart. It has nothing to do with the individual. I don't even know them personally, <laughs> so it has nothing to do with it. I'm, I'm basing on experience and what has happened with us in the county. Um, number two, when will they inform us of days this, this has occurred? When do we get a form as commissioners? Because that position reports to on the pleasure reports to the board of commissioners. So they have a certain amount of vacation days they receive. I've never known when a county manager is on vacation. So how do we know that they're utilizing their vacation days? So if they have to leave, we as the county have to pay this out. So what is, where's the structure of where they're actually reporting the days they've actually used? How do we know this as commissioners and how, where is it being reported as the county? I've never received, and maybe it's just me, I've never received anything. And sometimes I have no idea when the county manager is present. And that's with both of the, the county manager. I had no idea if they're on vacations or what. So there's no process of reporting of when they are not on campus or not here. Sorry, campus, I teach college. So when they're not in the building. So I have no idea. Who knows um, about the vacation time? So how is it documented? Um, working from home. I've had constituents tell me that the county manager is working from home. I don't see that anywhere in the contract. So that needs to be addressed. Are we providing a hybrid uh, employment? So we need to address that. That needs to be in detail because we are coming from the crisp of, of COVID. So we need to understand that because I had no idea that the county manager had an option to work from home or if that was, was an option. So that's not even addressed in the contract. Um, will it be the same vehicle or a new vehicle? We don't, all this has not been addressed. 
Um, all such expenses must be approved that ties into some of the budget of the commission of commissioners. Um, so in regards to the training, it's supposed to be pre-approved. I have never, since I've been here, I have never had the county manager come before us to pre-approve any of their training information. I, I haven't since I've been on this board. And as we look at the previous county manager in the training, he even received the fellowship. He went to a fellowship program with Harvard and spent thousands of dollars on that program. So we no longer have that interim county manager. Do they pay it back if they leave us early? What is that placed in the contract? It's not listed in detail. So um, involuntary termination, um, it has to be a super majority vote at, at a public meeting. Um, I would like to know is that, I didn't see that in the last contract about a super majority vote at a public meeting. Correct me if I'm wrong, if that's been standard, and I would, and I'm with the, I meant to ask you, uh, direct the shoemaker for the one last year, um, but normally if we're, Get rid, and I want to say get rid of terminating a county manager. It's been three to two. So I'm noticing the contract. It said involuntary termination, supermajority vote at a public meeting. So that means four commissioners have to agree in order to terminate a county manager. So I would like to know if that is standard. If that's been the other contract. If so, I, I stand corrected. But I normally read these thoroughly, and I have not seen that being mentioned. So I have an issue with that. Um, in regards to resignation, if they happen to resign before the contract is over, what are the policies if they have to pay back certain things, like for instance, the training? Um, those And that affects also the commissioners who have to go for training for various things because we all are using the same travel budget. That's why I opposed to our finance director to separate it and make sure everybody has their own training budget because if you, we don't even know when the county manager goes for different training. So when a commissioner wants to come and go to a training that's uh, something we need to do for the county and bring back information, we can't go because the budget has been depleted. So these things need to be actually put in place. Um, Non-disclosure, items presented to us after the fact, as we know, and I can't go in detail with information that was presented from the interim county manager of things that happened within the county for a whole year, the commissioners were not even privy to until after he left. And these are things that affect the county's bottom line, things that are unethical. So there needs to be a clause put in there that states if there's something to occur, you are required to report this to the people that you report to. Because not when you get upset or mad or something that you come out with all this information that happened within the county and we're not even aware of that. that that's, that's a problem. In regards to uh, performance, um, who's protecting the county? That's my whole point. Who's protecting the county? Performance appraisal. It says deem necessary. Now we know from our situation with our previous lawsuits with the county manager. One of the things the attorney said is that we as commissioners do not do our appraisals on um, consistently, on time, and annually. So it should not say deem as necessary, it should say annually, because that was one of the things that she mentioned. She said, how can you determine if a person is doing their job or not doing their job when you have no reviews in place and you appoint them? So to say deem as necessary, it should be stated, we're going to provide an annual review annually. I've said this the last, uh, I've been saying this, everything I'm saying is consistent. Um, and those are basically all the issues that I have with that contract. I really think we should table this until it is actually outlined in detail because there's a lot of issues with this contract. I've said it every year. Who's protecting the county when we have issues. I did not know some some of the uh, residents who keep account. We have had six managers in less than a decade. I didn't know that because I went on the board. I just know about the ones we had. We have had six county managers in less than a decade. Who's protecting the county? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Make a motion. Commissioner Edwards, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, just time I'd like to make a motion to approve the appointment of Harold Cooper as county manager with conditions as stated by the county HR director. It's motion by it's been motioned by Commissioner um, Edwards and second by Commissioner Mason. Any discussion? Commissioner Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I would like I would like to make a substitute motion to uh, table this until we have uh, a little more time to work out the country. Second. It's been motioned that we uh, it's been a substitute motion by Commissioner Henderson and second by Commissioner Sanders. Um, any discussion? All in yes, favor? Mr. Chair. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
can I discuss? I don't know. You tell me in the comments. Discuss. Uh, you just, I, you just, I mean, you just, you gave your point. So, and very oh, well, okay. very well taken. Very well taken. Uh, okay. Let's, you, wow. let's vote it. Let's vote it up or vote it down. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? It failed. The table failed. Go back to the original motion. It was motioned by Commissioner Edwards and second by Commissioner Mason. Any discussion? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, I do have discussion. Commissioner again, oh, Sanders, go ahead. Again, who's protecting the county? We have to not think about the individual. This hasn't, we already voted who the county manager, and actually the motion was, I vote for Harold Cooper as the county manager, but that motion was not for his contract. We already voted for a county manager. So the motion should have been, I vote for the contract to be approved. That's what we're voting for today. And I'm only speaking on the contract, not the person that you all voted to be the county manager. So let's take that out of our heads and not be emotional in that point. Commissioners, look at this contract. I've had commissioners send me Mr. Carr's contract that sit on the board in front of you all and had a problem with that contract. You need to look at this contract and make sure you're protecting the people of Newton County. It has nothing to do with Mr. Cooper. I don't know him personally. And when I did my vote based on uh, county managers, based on experience, on experience and not the individual. So take emotions out of it and look at this contract. Who's protecting the county? We just had issues with a county manager not coming to work for a year. Mr. Chairman, you said you had an active county manager for a whole year, and we paid $150,000. Thank you. Commissioner Cowan. Um, Gerard and Davis, y'all have reviewed this contract. Is that correct? That is correct. It's legally sufficient? Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor? Any opposed? Nay. Any opposed? You, you opposed? And commission opposed? Okay, pass 3-2. Thank you. Chairman, we are at item number 12A, Citizen Norman Bethay with Serenity House for discussion and consideration. This is 12A, the agenda amendment edition. Good evening, Good evening. Good evening. Do you want to pass out a pamphlet? Thank you. I'm Norman, representing Serenity House. Thank you. Swinney House is a nonprofit organization that house people that are displaced, homeless, at risk, veterans. We also offer a women's location that offers a refuge for women dealing with domestic issues. This September will be 14 years of service to the community. We have four locations. We have a proven evidence-based track record of serving over 3,000 clients with an 84% success rate, the highest in the state of Georgia. I'm here seeking a signature to receive funds for Newton County to house the homeless and displaced. The state is requiring a signature to acknowledge funds being allocated for Newton County. The funds are not out of the budget of Newton County, but it's just given to the organization to uh, service the community. That's it. Thank you. Um, you want to help? Go ahead. Commissioners, um, there is no liability um, on the part of the county for this. All they're doing is seeking for an approval from this board so that they can get a grant from the DCA. So there is no liability on the county whatsoever. 
so so he's actually basically asking um, that the, for permission for the chairman to execute this document for them to apply for, um, I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, $70,000 yes. uh, from the DCA. Um, I felt like it was important that it come before the board to get a permission to do that. So here we are. Commissioner Cowan got questions. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Do you have a physical presence in Newton County? Yes, we've been here for about six years. We've been in uh, organization for about 14. Well, your, your address is Redan. That's just our mailing address. We have four locations. We're here in Newton. Where are you at? Uh, near Connect Road. Connect Road. On yes. I welcome you to come see anytime you want to. I, I know where Connect Road is. Is that the only location? Yes. Okay. And what type of facility do you have? Just, just general housing for people that are in need. Have you gotten a permit from the county? Yes, we permit? have uh, uh, permission to zoning and uh, state regulations. Uh, we have a license. State so you license. got a special use permit from the county? Yes. Okay. Any more questions? Any more? Uh, Commissioner Mason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm just seeking clarity in regards to what our county uh, attorney stated. So this isn't um, the Board of Commissioners giving $70,000. This is just approving documentation so that uh, this organization can apply for a $70,000 grant through DCA. That is correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner um, Henderson. Um, I have, I mean, I take pride in probably knowing kind of what's going on and I haven't, haven't seen the facility or, seen, or maybe even spoke to some of the people who may participate in it. Uh, I, would, I would like uh, for us to table it to give uh, anybody, any commissioners, the opportunity to go out and, and look at that particular facility. Rather than just me take a word, I like to see for myself. Sure. There's not too much to ask. Sure. I, I, I encourage so, everyone to come see. Did you make a motion? So, but he's saying he want to table this. Yes, I want to. Let me tell you. Give, yeah, yeah, no, go ahead. Explain. I wanted to table to give the board the opportunity to go in and maybe look at the facility, search as myself, get the address and look at it and see what type highs ran. I don't think there's too much to ask if, if you were gonna so, add, so give I'm the a, Let me just may, say, if I, may I get may I finish please? And before we uh, before I think we'll get up the chairman opportunity to uh, allow you through the county to apply for funds and said that I feel assured for my constituents that I know exactly how we are uh, giving folks to go ahead and for getting money. So Mr. Norman um, expressed to me today that he is under a um, deadline, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Of uh, how long? It's, it has to be submitted Friday. So uh, it's either it's approved or it's just uh, lost and we cannot serve the citizens of uh, Newton County. So let me let me ask a couple of questions. Maybe it can help. Um, so this is your first time applying for funds on behalf of Newton. Yes, my first time. Yes. And Connect Road is where's Connect Road? I'm not familiar with Connect Road. Uh, Brown Bridge Highway 20. Where? It's in the Magnet community. Yes, yes. It's kind of like half Rockdale and half Newton, but yes. I'm sorry? Okay. I, I haven't. I'm not, I haven't. Will that, will that hold up the delay of the sign? If, if, if the board votes to table this, um, it, it, it will, yeah. And, and the citizens of uh, uh, Newton will suffer for that. Mr. Chairman, may I ask a question? Sure. Um, I apologize, I didn't get your name, sir. But this is my first time hearing of the organization. I wish you would have came before the board when we were asking for uh, assistance with the homeless, because 
we could have provided you with funding um, like we did with the other homeless uh, organization that we have here in Newton County. So I, this is my first time even hearing about it. So thank you so much for your service in doing this. But I, I, I believe with me, our first time, well, my first time, I only can speak for myself. My first time hearing about it, I have no information. I was looking through my packet and I apologize. I don't have anything in my packet on on what we're voting on. So that, that's my that's my concern. I wish I had some information and my apologies to you, but I, I have nothing to vote on that will give me a viable vote as a commissioner and representing the residents in, in New County. But I believe that we should have more organizations in the county that represent homelessness. But to be honest with you, I don't know what specifics I'm voting on besides a grant. So did we get a motion? We didn't get a motion. There was a motion at the table. I think you made a motion at the table. I, I didn't, but I was did. trying to reserve the right to for the uh, commissioner of the district. Uh, Mr. Graham, I'd like to make a motion to table this. I, I guess uh, do you want to have a special call meeting once we kind of go out and look at the commissioner and want to look at it and stuff? You, you tell me what you want to do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't, I, I've never heard of this organization, and I'm looking on your website. I, I think these are great goals, great Absolutely. core values. Um, I see the 2022 economical impact. Um, I, I see all this information, but I don't see an address uh, for what you've provided, and I've never, and, and I'm now I'm just being told that this is in District Two, and I've never heard of it, or ne I've never seen it at well, all. Uh, we, we do have a women's location, okay. and sometimes there's domestic issues, and we do keep the addresses uh, reserved. Sure, I, I, and I respect that. Um, I, I guess it would just be great. Um, it it would have been beneficial prior to coming before the board if you know exactly what commissioner that district is in have that conversation uh with that commissioner uh even if you wanted to keep it private and not put it on the website just so that that commissioner whose district it is can be a vouch for you and can say yes i've been to this facility yes i've had a conversation uh yes i know and that commissioner can stand behind uh what it is that you're trying to do uh, i'm a huge uh, proponent for the homeless community. Uh, as a matter of fact, a couple years ago, I started an unsheltered job and housing initiative. Uh, and so I've put that out there so many times uh, to let people know that this is something that I'm passionate about and I really want to help that portion of our community. And so it would have been great if we would have had more details and more information prior to us finding this out and we have three days to make a decision. Yeah, um, and, and I please forgive me for that. But I did find out <laughs> Thursday, and so when I found out about it, I got onto it, and this lends us to this meeting. I just found out about it myself. Sure, I completely understand. It, it's just challenging for me to make an intelligent business and, decision um, and not have and, any details. And for clear and, and for uh, comfort, above the signature, you can withdraw your endorsement at any time it says that right above the signature when when is there's, there's no risk to the county there's no, so, no so, funds to the county so when is the next time that you'll be able to apply for this grant next year i'm sorry next year next year all three counties have signed out already i'm just waiting for newton when you say all three counties, what three counties? Uh, there's two within Atlanta uh, and then Rockdale also. So Rockdale and Fulton? Yes. You have Fulton, then you have City of Atlanta. And so, and, and just to clarify, Mr. Chair, um, the county isn't being asked to give any funds but you as our chair are you comfortable with signing this documentation to be able to vouch 
No, so this is why I asked him to come tonight um, because, um, and you know, it's all truth. Um, he asked me today, could I sign it? And I told him I couldn't sign it. Hmm. And I'm not sure if he had a full understanding why. Um, and I told him he would be able to come tonight before the board uh, to ask permission um, for me to execute my signature on that document. And I'm not really comfortable doing it. With, I, well, I won't do it without the board's approval. And I think we, we really do want to help you. And we do want to um, support this. It's just we don't have enough information. We don't have enough details. And before we can make an intelligent business decision um, on anything that we stamp our approval on, we want to make sure that we've had time to do our due diligence. Uh, and so uh, I think with, with that being said, um, I'm going to have to make a motion that we uh, deny this. but continue to stay in contact with us so that we can know more about your program uh, and be able to support you uh, in the near future. Uh, and that is n nothing against your program. It's nothing against you personally. It's just that we have, we have, to, un we have to be able to do our due diligence. Uh, and so anybody that comes before us, we want to make sure that we've dotted our I's, crossed our T's before I put, we put our stamp of approval on anything. And hopefully that's something that you understand. And this is a quick follow-up question. So um, the money that you received from, um, from Fulton and Rockdale, is that set aside just for Fulton and Rockdale? Yes. So, so if I have someone from Newton County that needed housing, I can't. So, we're, so how do you generate your funding now? That's what I was about to say. Well, we have, we, we, we work with the state and the feds, so we have for years. Yeah. So, every, so year you, you, every, every year you're going through different grants and different things. So with that being said, um, is it possible that you can continue the way that you're getting your funding for your Newton location now, give us some time to do some due diligence and then possibly come back before us because now we'll be fully aware of what you're doing, how you're impacting the Newton County community, who you're assisting, who you're helping. We'll have more details and information uh, by the next time you're able uh, or you want us to put our stamp of approval on something to submit to DCA yeah, uh, for the just, grant dollars. Uh, Commissioner Mason, I just, uh, the citizens will suffer just because we're waiting for that right there. But right. You're, are they suffering now because I, as how are you through, getting funding now? As I walk through Newton County, I see people and I get calls from, for help. Right. And it's a shame that I can't help them. Right. So. So if you weren't, if you didn't submit for this grant through DCA, would it, you just have to shut your whole new location? Grants, there's other grants that are expiring. So this one is supposed to overlap and kick in. So starting when this one, when that one expires, I will not be able to house anyone. So who's done your previous grants? Mm -hmm. The state and the feds, state and feds. Okay, so are you able to submit additional grants? Because uh, usually they're Pacific. And they're That's usually right. specific to uh, so, who they and, serve. And I hate to do this, but we're going we to cut this okay. short. But okay. I, and Thank I hate you. to do this, I'm but I, I, I got to. And I hate to, hate to do it, but I got to. So are you just now finding out about it for Newton? Because you said, yeah, Rockdale, was, and, you said Rockdale and Fulton has already signed off on it. So, and then you said you just found out about it for Newton. No, no, I found out about it for all of them, but everybody signed off on it. No, this is the only county that didn't sign off on it. I can't do that. I can't do it. Yeah, I can, I'm sorry, I, I can't do that. Yeah. Is it what the to motion? Table. To table. Or actually to deny, I'm to sorry. Deny. Okay. Uh, to deny. Hey, you second, Commissioner Henderson. It's been motioned by Commissioner Mason and second by Commissioner Henderson. Any discussion? All in favor? Commissioner Sanders. Aye. Thank you. Guys, it's staying denied. Uh, um, next is citizens' comments. This opportunity that we allow citizens to make comments 
Um, you, can, you may come at this time. Please state your name and address for the record, please. You have three minutes to do so. So I'm going to be brief. I forgot to mention that I do have um, petitions. Um, I do hope that um, Mr. Harold Cooper knows what he is walking into. Um, and I do hope that he's the best county manager that you've ever had because for the most part, I believe your next elections will probably depend on that, um, what happens here. It's interesting, the contract, um, I, it seems like it should have taken a, you should have taken a little more time with that, but again, um, you have to answer for it, and um, you are answerable to the county citizens. Now, the, um, I have petitions that were signed by people who will be voting um, in the next year or two, and I've sent copies of these petitions to you, plus there are petitions online that requested um, that you rethink your appointment and consider rescinding um, the appointment that you made. But you did what you did, and so Everyone has to live with this, including you. And you have to answer for it in a couple of years. So, or less, as one person's election is coming up a little sooner than two years. So we, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Again, I hope he's the best county manager you've, we've ever had. I hope he moves us in the direction we need to move in. I hope we don't spend the whole year training him to go somewhere else um, and money training him to go somewhere else. I really do hope that is not the case because again, we're all dependent on you to make the right decisions, you know, to act like grown-ups. Please, please, please do that. Thank you. Excuse me. Um, you mentioned petitions. Did you want those for the record or no? Yeah. What I did is I took pictures of them and I emailed them to you. And I had gotten an okay. extra one, too, after the one I emailed to you. So, so those are the same ones? I scanned okay. them, right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you another one with, that's more completed. Thank you. Plus, we have some on um, change.org. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening. My name is Sue Collins. I live at 730 Wehunt Road. And uh, I have talked to Mr. Edwards about this, but I wanted to come here because I heard tonight about how concerned you are about the citizens of uh, Newton County. So I am encouraged. We got our new um, 2023 tax information and we were stunned because our property uh, appraisal went up this year $90,000, which means that our taxes will then rise to to almost nine hundred dollars more than last year and this was in addition to our taxes that went up last year and i didn't come down here last year and complain but i am here today because what's going to happen to us that uh, are out there because i don't know why they have gone up so quickly except i hear it's because the um uh, property values have gone up, but in where we are, we still do not have access to county water. We don't have access to county sewer. We live on a dirt road, and we do not get high-speed internet, even though we have a fiber optic uh, cable that goes right in front of our house, but we are not able to access that. Um, what exactly are we paying for? And yet, um, um, we have these high school taxes, which I understand you don't have anything to do with that, and I certainly haven't had any kids in school for a long time, as you can see. Um, I am just here to vent 
and I'd like to have your help because we don't qualify for a lot of giveaway programs because we have too much money, but we won't have if the taxes continue to rise as they are because I'm not working anymore. So I would just like to have your help, and I understand that I've already vented to uh, Mr. Edwards, and he's been very kind, and he told me that I needed to um, fill out an appeal. And so I went online and I got the papers, but I want you to know that I have been told numerous times that that is an exercise in futility. So um, I don't think that we'll go that route. But I did want you to know I am not happy. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Commissioner Edwards. Commissioner Mason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have uh, one announcement. Uh, we're excited uh, in District 2 to uh, announce that we're going to have our first uh, movie in the park at Denny Dobbs Park on this Friday. Uh, starting around 6, 6.30 p.m. Uh, we're looking to have, uh, we're going to be watching the movie Encanto, so it will be uh, for Cinco de Mayo. I have partnered with uh, an amazing uh, 501c3 nonprofit organization for our Hispanic community uh, called Ayuda Hispana Outreach. Uh, so we're excited to uh, partner together to really be able to help um, encourage our Hispanic uh, community to uh, be a part of our community as well. So we're excited about that. Uh, so we just want to invite everybody to come out on um, this Friday, uh, starting at around 6 or 6.30 p.m. for our movie in the park, uh, Denny Dobbs Park, uh, for our Cinco de Mayo celebration. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, Commission Sanders. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Um, for those who are not aware, I'm currently in St. Louis, Missouri. I was appointed to the National Social Engineer County's core committee, one of the 20 elected officials, as well as judges are with me and the sheriffs, mayors, council, and so forth. And so the organization is called CORE, which is County Officials Advancing Racial Equity. Uh, and it aims to look at the, the ethnic disparities or the, in the criminal justice system. And so we go to counties to visit those particular counties that got it right and to bring it back to our counties and to our state to make sure we are handling it as well, decreasing the amount of people in um, the prison system, as well as making sure that certain races are not receiving more time than others. So the conversation has to be had. I know a lot of people don't like to talk about race and disparities, but they do exist. So the conversations have to be had. So we're here in St. Louis having the conversation with multiple backgrounds and talking about that as well as our youth. And one of the things they brought up was youth programming to reduce crime. Uh, one of the commissioners stated that she would like to find out what the problem is. So that's one of the things we're going to have to do in the county is we've got to do a lot of data. A lot of counties are doing that. They're collecting that data to find out how many people are in the prison system, where is majority of the crime coming from that are actually in the prison system, and you need to go into those areas and change the culture, providing the programming for the youth. That was mentioned over and over during this conference, which is the reason why that I fight so hard for our youth, especially in District 3, especially making sure this facility is up because they've asked for mental health uh, uh, professionals. One in five individuals have mental illness in the United States of America. So you can count one, two, three, four, five, and that fifth person has mental illness in the United States of America. And a lot of it is our youth. And we heard our judge mention that majority of people that come before her in youth court have mental illness, our kids. So my plea to you, commissioners, that we set all things and differences aside to make sure we're taking care of our community and get this facility up where it needs to be in the area that's having the most crime and the most kids that need it, and the area where the kids ask for mental therapy and help. I also had the opportunity to travel with uh, Walton Cares, which is an organization that uh, provides for the youth. They do peer-to-peer -peer learning. I didn't even know that there is a peer program with the state of Georgia for those who are 18 to 29 to get licensed to do like a therapist does. 
but they actually are peers. So if somebody's going through opioid situation or have the drug addiction or alcoholism, they're able to talk to their peer who actually recovered from that program and they're licensed to talk, which we're trying to hopefully bring to Newton County. It's, it's worked through the Walton County, uh, part of our judicial system with the Alcove, but they're looking to be, expand more into Newton County, which I'll hopefully they'll be coming before the board to present their plight because they already work in Newton County, but we need to identify them. So my, again, commissioners, we need to set all differences aside of what's going on with us and think about our people in this county and our youth, especially in District 3, because that's if you look at statistically, that's where your crime is coming from. And the main concern is there's nothing for these youth to do. I sent a family connection board and we get data. I sent that data directly to you all and you saw the data. We are high in rates of, such as STDs are in Newton County. We are higher than the state of Georgia. And kids are going to result to bad behavior because they have nothing positive that's being implemented into their lives. And we as elected official have that power to provide the programming they need. And you heard on that video that I sent you to where those programs that are successful, they said they went to the kids to ask them what they wanted. They said a lot of programs don't work because we as adults trying to still live our young lives and make decisions and thinking kids are required. So thank you so much for this time and many blessings to everyone. Commissioner, um, um, Henderson. <laughs> thank you. Uh -huh. <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Singh. <clears throat> um, it's, just, it's just simple. You know, there's been so much to talk about uh, doing something for our youth. Uh, we know that uh, summertime is almost upon us, and we're going to be kids doing stuff, uh, gang violence, and et cetera, you name it. And we learned that they're recruiting this, the young kids, four and five years of age, to be a, become a gang member. So, you know, I prayed about it, and I thought about it, and I talked to the community. And what we're gonna do at Nelson Heights, we're gonna invite kids from all over in Newton County. Come on over there and spend the day with us, uh, uh, basketball camp, uh, movies, in daytime and at night, especially, especially the facility house a inside camera that they can use to as well for our youth. And we wanna invite the parents over you know, we're not going to stand by and just let our children go out and do all kind of things. We're going to help them. And the only way we can help them is by doing them. So I'm inviting the Board of Commissioners, the Commissioners. I'm inviting the churches, which I'll be on their door. Say, come out. Let's do something positive, something for our kids while we give them a breakfast and a meal uh, this summer. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Commissioner Cowan. Thank you. Board, I seek a motion that we adjourn, please. Second. It's been motioned by Commissioner Henderson, second by Commissioner Mason. All in favor? Aye. All right. Thank you all. Have a good evening. <laughs>